Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the court hall. I'm Robin Tolkien-Fry, tenured reader in 20th century modernism, and I welcome you here along with my co-convener, Glenn Sujo, to this day of celebrating the scholarly and pedagogical legacy of Dr. Shuni Fair and an event we have titled Art, Culture, Politics, and Society, German Art in an Expanded Field. Today we've brought together, in a tribute to Shunamit's impact and legacy, a roster of seven renowned scholars of German art in an expanded field who will present a range of papers covering pre-war, wartime, and post-war subjects written for this occasion. Throughout the afternoon, in addition to these papers, we will also have time for discussion in panels and question and answer sessions, followed by tributes at 6 p.m. <laughs> when I left the Humboldt University in Berlin to take up my post as lecturer at the Courthold, I entered a realm entirely created for me by Schumann. In her honor, a former student and then recent MA graduate, Nikolai Tangen, along with his wife, endowed an academic post the Katja and Nikolai Tangen Lecturer in 20th Century Modernism in honor of Dr. Trudeau Bear, as a tribute to sustaining her impact on scholarship and teaching. Arriving in the UK as a complete foreigner to the multiple systems here, Shulimi was always a welcoming and authoritative presence. In part, she knew just what it was like to arrive at mid-age in a new country and set about continuing a career in art history. She took a lively interest in my academic work and settlement, while also sharing her own updates, conferences, contributions to exhibitions, a steady stream of publications, articles, exhibition catalog essays, and progress on her magnus opus, Women, Artists, and Expressionism, From Empire to Emancipation. Annually, I invited her to give a guest lecture to my MA students enthralling those new generations with her expertise on expressionism, especially female artists, one of her areas of unparalleled expertise. Treasured colleague, mentor, teacher, and friend to so many in the Cornwall community and beyond, bears outstanding contribution to the understanding of modern experience through art, in expressionism, in the apperception of exile, in excavating dynamic roles for women artists, is underscored through a set of meticulous research practices and inquiries, which she pursued with rigor across a range of media and theoretical framings. These include her three major monographs, Women Expressionists from 1988, the Tate's volume Expressionism from 1999, translated into nine languages, and her magnificent Women and Express Artists in Expressionism from Empire to Emancipation in 2022. Her editing has been assessed from 1993 with David Fanning and uh, Douglas Jarman and Arts in Exile in Britain from 19, uh, 1933 to 1945, Politics and Cultural Identity, edited with Mary Marais. Her work on exhibitions brought wider, uh, broader audiences to German modernism. These include her own exhibition, Gabriella Mancha, <coughs> The Search for Expressionism, 1906 to 1917, in 2005, at the Courthold Gallery, accompanied by a catalog. And though she helped organize, such as Conrad Felix Muller, 1897 to 1997, between politics and the studio, as well as insightful essays, she contributed to others' publications, such as New Perspectives on Brook Expressionism, from 2011, edited by Christian Wyckoff, who will be delivering a paper today. And more recently, Making Modernism at the Royal Academy of Arts, edited and curated by Sarah Leah and Dorothy Price, who will give our first paper today. These publications are an enduring tribute to her meticulous and beautiful writing, as well as her attention to detail. Her teaching and mentoring of MA and PhD students lives on in the work of those shaping the field today. And we are honored to have so many of you among us today. Today's program is being recorded and will be available after uh, the 9th of April, easily searchable on the Courthold's YouTube channel for any of um, your colleagues or friends who couldn't be here today. On behalf
behalf of Glenn and myself, I'd like to take a moment to thank those who have supported this event today. From the start, uh, then Cornhill Director Deborah Swalla immediately lent her support to the event, as has current director Mark Hallett. Glenn and I are thankful to both. <laughs> We're thankful to the Bear family, Bernard, and his two sons, Elijah and Gabriel. We especially welcome them and their guests here today. At the Cornhill, a special thanks to Leila Brumba, Research Forum Program Manager, who has truly gone above and beyond to create a day fitting to the importance of the occasion, as well as her team, Grace Williams, our digital producer, Diego Arteche, Research Forum Events Producer, and their student assistants. To the speakers today, Glenn and I are thankful for your contributions and for traveling to London to join the event. And speaking from my own side, I'm exceedingly grateful to have worked alongside Glenn for the past 11 months. And putting together today's program, I'm exceptionally thankful for both his wider vision, essential in the early stages of the planning, and his keen attention to detail, which came into full focus in the lead up to today. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Dorothy Price, FBA is a professor of modern and contemporary art and critical of race art history here at the Cornhill. Ranging from German modernism to black and Asian art in Britain, her extensive body of research is informed by an interest in the operations of race, sexuality, and gender in relation to the visual. Among her many books, I single out for relevance here, German Expressionism, Du Blau Reiter and its Legacies from 2020, Making Modernism, um, Paula Modernism Becker, Kate Krowitz, Gabriela Munter, and Mariana Berkin, 2022, also the Akonis named um, exhibition, and Weimar Women, Photography and Modernity in 1920s Germany from 2019, and that's just recently. She is a former editor of Art History and a prolific curator currently on view at the RA is Entangled Pasts. 1768 to now, Art, Colonialism, and Change. Her paper today is um, Imaging the Maternal, the Shadow of Death in the Art of Kate Kovitz. Please welcome Dr. Thank you very much, Robin, <clears throat> um, for that introduction. Um, and as a talisman right on cue, I brought this with me. Um, it's a book that I have treasured and um, taken much inspiration from throughout my career. <clears throat> and in fact, as I was starting my PhD at the University of Essex <laughs> in 1990, Schulmich was just leaving to take up her post at um, the Courtauld Institute of Art. And when I eventually submitted my PhD, she was my external examiner, and I remember it vividly, having my uh, viva in her bijou office in the Courtauld. Um, and since then, uh, throughout my career, um, my interest in German women artists has absolutely, undoubtedly, and unshakably been a its influence. Um, so I have Schulamit to thank for a lot of the successes of my career. And I was extremely, excuse me, <clears throat> extremely honoured when she agreed to contribute a catalogue essay for making modernism which opened at the RA in November 2022. And what I hadn't really appreciated, I mean, she wrote her essay, she wrote a beautiful essay on Jakob von Heemskirk uh, and Marianne Ferefkin. And what I hadn't appreciated was that she was obviously very unwell at the time, but she, she wrote her essay uh, and delivered it on time, unlike me, <laughs> I was late with my, um, and it was a beautiful essay. I, I feel very privileged that it was probably her last catalogue um, essay. Um, uh, which seemed very fitting, you know, that my career had sort of started with her and that I bring her into that project. Um, okay, sorry, that's my <laughs> mini tribute over. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to talk about Keta Colditz today, um, hence this photograph um, of Colditz with her sons, Hans and Peter, before 19, taken before 1914. Um, Colvitz's approach to the maternal is complex, and that's what I want to focus on today. It was interesting, in putting this paper together, trying to find a photograph of Colvitz as a mother, actually pictured with her two sons, Hans, the oldest, 
born in 1892, and Peter, four years younger than Hans, born in 1896. Most photographs of Colbitz are highly constructed poses of her, on her own, emulating the gestures we see in her many self-portraits, holding a piece of charcoal, or her head gently resting in her hands, or else her full frontal face, but very few with her family. And for an artist who specializes in powerful renditions of mothers and children, I thought this one on screen at the moment was an oddly counterintuitively stiff and emotionally detached photograph, although much in keeping with the studio traditions of the era, but nevertheless slightly at odds with the powerfully visceral work that she has made. <clears throat> in so many of her images of mothers and children, Colbitz disrupts conventional renditions of serene motherhood by depicting the maternal as a state of physical absorption and psychic possession. Utterly compelling works like Frau mit Kind of 1903 and Tod und Frau of 1910 stand outside the Western cultural tradition of spiritual and dematerialized motherhood, symbolized at its height by the Immaculate Conception and the Virgin Birth. Frau mit Tod und Kind, woman with dead child, visualizes the unspeakable pain of maternal loss, whereas death in the woman, Tod und Frau, hovers in that uniquely liminal space peculiar to Colbitz between symbolism and social commentary. Colbitz combines the secular figure of the mother with the representation of the nude, two poles of femininity that are usually kept apart and publicly available, sorry, usually kept apart, the publicly available erotic body and the intimately reproductive one. Such a focus on dualities between self-portraits and nudes, nudes and mothers, visual representation and maternal origin, was bound up with conflict around the role of the artist and that of the mother during the period in which she was working, and which she articulates clearly in her diaries, letters, and journals. <clears throat> but what I want to focus on today, in particular, is the role of death within Colbert's imaging of the maternal. Colbert's images of death are complex. In many instances, they retain a dependent whilst also inflecting and departing from it. Responses to the prospect of death in Colbert's earth are seen in many guises, from inspiration to revenge, from fear, pain, and sacrifice to its eventual welcome. And throughout, there remains a strong, triadic relationship between the theme of mother-child death. As many scholars have frequently demonstrated for Edvard Munch, but not often for Colbert's, some of Colbert's attitudes to death in adulthood might have had their origins in her very earliest experiences of multiple sibling deaths within her family and the complex range of emotions that the child Colbert's experienced and witnessed in her own mother. As she recalls in an account of her childhood in 1922, she wrote, <clears throat> before Conrad's death, sorry, before Conrad's birth, mother had lost two children. She had lost her first as well as the one born after it. But although she never surrendered to the deep sorrow of those early days of her marriage, it must have been her years of suffering which gave her forever after the remote air of a Madonna. <clears throat> and with the death of Benjamin, her mother's last child, Colbert's mistakenly believed herself to blame. For having built a toy temple of sacrifice to Venus, instead of avowing her love for the God of Christianity during Benjamin's final hours. She wrote, I instantly felt certain that this was punishment for my unbelief. Now, God was taking revenge for my sacrifice to Venus. I believed myself to blame for my brother's death. Then I saw little Benjamin lying on the bed in, front, in the front room and looking so white and pretty, and I thought, if only we open his eyes, maybe he will come alive after all. These psychically rich passages on the death of her siblings and the subsequent funeral of Benjamin and the effects on her mother, as recorded in Colbert's journal, are quite extensive, running over several pages and concluding with a very moving account of her subsequent and related childhood fears 
for the death of her parents. And she writes, in those days, my love for my mother was tender and solicitous. I was always afraid she would come to some harm. If she were bathing, even if it were only in the tub, I feared she might drown. Once I stood at the window watching for mother to come back, for it was time. Once again, I felt that oppressive fear in my heart that she might get lost and never find her way back to us. Then I became afraid that mother might go mad. But above all, I feared the grief I would endure if mother and father should die. Sometimes this fear was so dreadful that I wished they were already dead, so that it would all lie behind me. Lost mother, mad mother, dead mother, the imagining and imaging of death as centered on the experiences of mothers and children in particular never waned throughout Colvitz's career. Death haunts Colvitz's Earl throughout her practice and is often found in proximity to women and children. As a motif in her work, it is, all, it is most commonly interpreted, if at all, as a generic symbolist motif in her pre-war work and as an obvious reference to the fatalities of the First World War in her post-1918 work. But as such a frequent motif in the work of a supposedly realist artist preoccupied with political and social injustice, how else might one view it? And this is um, the Weaver's Revolt um, of 1893 to 97, Colbert's first print cycle. In 1893, Colbert's attended a performance of Gerhard Hauptmann's play, The Weavers, based on the historical uprising of the Silesian Weavers in 1844. The play was initially banned by the state for its political subversiveness. Colbert was so moved by it that she immediately abandoned her work illustrating Zola's Germinal and spent the next four years working on this, her first major graphic series, The Weavers Revolt. The cycle consists of six individual plates, poverty, death, council, March of the Weavers, Storm in the Gate, and End. So just starting at the top and um, working <coughs> that way and then that way. <clears throat> they were conceived as a loose interpretation, though not a direct illustration of the narrative of Hadman's play. The distinction is affirmed in her choice of a title separate from but related to Hadman's. The first three plates were lithographs, and the last three were etchings. It was an early example of Colbert's response to Max Klinger's 1891 challenge to develop an epic suite of images linked by ideas. Its themes of poverty, infant mortality, populist rebellion, conflict and oppression became ones that she was so frequently to revisit throughout the course of her career. But what is of interest here for me is the way in which Colvitz introduces the symbolic figure of death, overtly but almost imperceptibly in plate two, and how that gesture of death's hand gently touching the woman, whilst at the same time firmly clasping the child around the neck, makes its first of multiple subsequent appearances. The most paired back version of this can be found towards the end of her career in the last print of her final series, the 1934 lithograph, The Call of Death. What's interesting in the 1934 series is that the figure of death as both villain and consoler, already evident in the single plate of the weavers, is reprised and spread across nine prints, almost as a final statement and a closing of the loop of her career in print cycles. In the midst of her work on the Weavers' Revolt, Colbert's all also completed a new sheet entitled From Many Wounds You Bleed, O People, which had originally been, been conceived as the final seventh plate of the cycle. Arranged in a tripartite structure and bearing the title as an, as an inscription at the top, the work clearly derives from iconographic traditions of the Lamentation of Christ. Indeed, Colbert would not have been short of potential iconographic models for this print. Franz von Stuck's 1891 painting being the most recent striking interpretation on the theme in which Christ is notable, 
for the absence of a halo. And there's a kind of little light at the back, but there's not a sort of, um, it's not a distinct halo in the way that, um, that Mary has. Um, very much in the spirit of Hans Holbein's Dead Christ in the Tomb of 1521. There was also Arnold Buckland's Mourning of Mary Magdalene over the Body of Christ of 1867 to 8. But this clearly has less of the stillness of the Holbein or the von Stuck, but perhaps more of the visceral, visceral grief of some of Colbert's later grieving mothers. And also, of course, Max Klinger's own Holbein-inspired rendition of the theme in 1889. <clears throat> What's particularly interesting, though, about von Stuck's painting, the one most closely recalling the Holbein, is its retrieval of a very specific kind of approach to the subject of the lamentation of Christ within German literary and visual culture, the Marianklager. The Marianklager was an originally medieval tradition that embodied maternal grief by stripping back local or temporal detail in order to specifically focus on that grief perhaps best exemplified in Colvitz's 1903 Woman with Dead Child. Furthermore, the stripped back setting of the entombment also likely referenced the iconographic traditions of the Byzantine um, Epitaphios, typically consisted of a large embroidered and often richly adorned cloth <coughs> bearing an image of the dead body of Christ, often accompanied by his mother and other figures following the Gospel account and used during the liturgical services on Good Friday and Holy Saturday. To have included from many wounds you bleed, O people, in the weaver's revolt would have fundamentally shifted the overall balance of the cycle away from a realist account towards a symbolic one. The Michelangelo in nudes tied to the columns flanking the central scene on either side further reinforced the symbolic intent and signified a number of possibilities from poverty and shame to suicide and prostitution. Those are the various iterations of the names that she was giving to this study as she was working on it. The redemptive nature of the Marianne Klager, or Lamentation, offers a poignant counterbalance to plate two of the Weaver's Revolt, death, and helps to excavate the symbolic resonance of the cycle more fully than usually accounted for. Yet Colbert's was advised against its inclusion by her friend, the art historian, Julius Elias, and the cycle has subsequently been read primarily as a declaration of Colbert's empathies with the proletarian classes. Nevertheless, it's a particularly telling episode in the historiography of the Weaver's Revolt, and Colbert's could not abandon the theme, developing its symbolic program even further in a separate drawing and print of 1900, entitled The Down Trodden. <clears throat> Whilst, as we've seen, the figure of death in the form of a skeleton makes the first of many literal appearances in Colvitz's Earth in Plate 2 of The Weaver's Revolt, I would also like to suggest that it fundamentally underpins the visual vocabulary of much of her Earth, whether physically present or not. For example, in plate four of the cycle, the March of the Weavers, the arm of the child seeking protection around her mother's neck is visually allied with a centrally placed scythe held firmly in the hand of the marching weaver behind them. So I'm looking at this, here, yeah, this arm and then this scythe. <clears throat> the child and the scythe become striking reminders of the violence to come and the innocence of the casualties caught up in the path of the Grim Reaper. <clears throat> the figure of death was already firmly ingrained within the 19th century revival of printmaking in Germany, in which Colbert was also operating. And this was not just via her most noted inspiration, Max Klinger, but also more specifically in political terms through Alfred Rethel, and in particular Rethel's popular six-plate print, six print cycle called Another Dance of Death, produced in 1848 and printed in 1849, and of which is this, this is plate two, Death Rides into Town, or Death Rides to the City. Rethel's 
cycle was produced in response to the failed revolutions that swept across Europe in 1848. Prompted by continued political oppression, the liberal middle classes had joined forces with the proletariat in a bid to obtain the long promised but consistently denied legislation for democratic, democratic rights, parliamentary representation, and the abolition of feudal privileges and censorship. In Prussia, fighting on the barricades raged for 24 hours until the revolution was bloodily suppressed by King Friedrich Wilhelm's army. Alfred Boyne, the art historian, has commented on how Lethal's series then and now raises the issue of what precisely constituted a reactionary or a liberal position amid a welter of political and ideological positions existing in Germany at mid-century. And as scholars remain divided about Lethal's own position in relation to the uprisings. Nevertheless, whatever Leopold's personal politics, another dance of death was heralded almost immediately as the most poignant aesthetic response to the bloody suppressions. So it's no coincidence that Colbert's decided to tackle the related 1844 Silesian uprisings almost half a century later in her own debut six-plate print cycle, The Weaver's Revolt. As Peter Parrott has demonstrated in producing his cycle, Little deliberately chose to enter into a dialogue with Hans Holbein's two great woodcut series, The Alphabet of Death and Images of Death, which had been reissued in print during the 1830s and the 1840s. The title of Little's cycle refers precisely to his intended dialogue with Holbein, Holbein. hence this was another dance of death. <clears throat> Parrott has noted that the motif of the Tortentanz, or Dance of Death, is documented from the mid-14th century onwards, first in the form of processions and dramatic performances, then in murals in churches and cemeteries, and finally in paintings, books, and graphics. The dance consisted generally of a procession or a continuous chain of couples, often, though not always, a man and a woman, about to be carried off by death, who was represented either as a skeleton or a decaying corpse. Holbein adopted both of these ways of depicting death, and, but broke up the procession into self-contained images. Some show only death and his victim. In others, death singles out one individual from a group. And in a few plates, several deaths appear. For Holbein and his contemporaries, death was a leveller and it is this that gives the motif its political leverage for both Rettel and Colbitz as well. Rettel had first treated the theme of death in an 1847 sketch entitled The Cholera, which he then developed into a woodcut with the alternate titles of Death as Avenger or Death as Enemy. The subject was likely based on Heinrich Heine's account of the cholera epidemic in Paris of 1831, Although, as usual with Gretel's images, the exact time and place are deliberately left indeterminate in favor of symbolic effect. In the center and surrounded by the dead and dying dancers, death plays a violin made from bones, whilst cholera sits on the bench behind him. Musicians and guests <laughs> attempt to leave, rushing out of the building at the top. The powerful visual triangulation between the arms, hands, an instrument of the central figure of death is also alluded to, I think, in plate three, wetting the scythe from the Peasants' War of 1902 to 1908, Colbert's next major print cycle after the Weaver's Revolt. Although also based on a loose interpretation of historical events rather than illustrative of any specific sources, we know that Colbert's read Wilhelm Zimmermann's General History of the Peasants' War, published in 1841 and was particularly inspired by his mention of the figure of Black Anna, a peasant woman who incited her peers to rebel. <clears throat> Colbert's Peasant's War consists of seven plates that were made out of sequence and then arranged into a rough narrative cycle once they'd been made. The plans raped, wetting the scythe, gathering arms, outbreak, battlefield, and the prisoners. Other than Black Anna, who appears in Blade 5, Outbreak, the cycle was not based on specific events. 
or people, but rather on the imagined stages of a, of a revolution. Colbert's chose to focus on the human cost for women and the suffering of the victims of poverty and oppression rather than the perpetrators. <clears throat> By Dengel, or Wetting the Scythe, as this one's called, exists in multiple versions, each impression slightly different from the last. And it was the final choice selected from a long process of different versions <clears throat> including the 1904 to 1905 prints, Inspiration on the left, and Frau mit Senza, or Woman with Scythe, on the right. It's clear from the many preliminary drawings and sketches for Inspiration that Colbert's laboured over the conception of this piece, and in particular the muscular figure in whose lap the woman is cradled as she is being instructed. While some scholars have interpreted the background figure as simply another peasant inspiring the woman how to wield her weapon of revenge upon the landowners. Perhaps a more plausible explanation is that the woman is in fact being instructed on how to use the scythe by the strong but shadowy personification of death. Again, a painterly iconographic precedence for the whispering inspiration of both angels and death abound within the history of art, with which Colbert would have been familiar from her trips to Italy, France, and the museums of Berlin, as well as the plethora of art periodicals produced during the era. <clears throat> so, for example, you have um, Rembrandt's version of the inspiration of St. Matthew, Caravaggio's version of the same scene, um, <coughs> But perhaps the closest symbolic application of death as inspiration, closer to home, can be found in Arnold Buckland's self-portrait with death as a fiddler from 1872. Yet unlike Buckland's skeleton, which is content to influence the artist through the vehicle of sound with barely any physical contact between them, Colbert's inspirational figure of death makes vigorous physical contact, placing its hand firmly on top of the woman's commanding her movement whilst keeping the other hand clenched over <coughs> her shoulder. The physicality of the figure of death, its muscular posture, derived from Colbert's exposure to Rodin, whose studio she visited just before making this print. Rodin's crouching woman, as well as the gates of hell with their muscled figures and representations of damned souls in constant motion throughout eternity, appeals to Colbert's. <coughs> determined as she was to dedicate her art to the theme of human suffering. Abschied und Tod, 1923 to 24, Farewell and Death, as if further support was needed for an analogy of the whispering figure of death as inspiration, can be found in subsequent works showing death whispering in the ear of the sitter, for example, this 1923 lithograph by Colbert's. <clears throat> the role of death in Colbert's work is both omnipresent and complex. The visceral emotional responses experienced from contemplating Woman with Dead Child of 1903 have suffused many subsequent receptions of her oeuvre. And however much one can diligently track visual iconography back to its sources, both historic and contemporary, nothing quite accounts for its continuing hold. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really rich and um, really wide um, talk. Um, and I think there'll be lots to talk about. Um, but let me introduce first our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sherman is an art historian specializing in German and Austrian 20th century art, who received her PhD from the Kornholm under the supervision of Schumann. Her research interests lie in histories of printmaking and theories of perception originating in the Gestalt school and in the careers of women artists and writers in 1920s Berlin, Vienna, and in exile in the UK. Publications include Reversal Values on the Woodblock and its Print in German Modernist Art, and 
emotional viewing on finding a visible relief in the German woodcut print, circa 1450 to 1921. Her paper today is Working Through the Woodcut, Ernst Arlach and Kathy Kulitz in the Aftermath of World War I. Please welcome Nicholas. And um, I'd just mm. like to preface my talk briefly with recognition of Shulamit's definitive chapter on Kate Kolbitz in her much lauded book, um, from which, amongst many things, I learned, in fact, uh, not only that, of course, um, Shulamit recognised that for Kate Kolbitz, who was a reluctant expressionist, that uh, Els Berla was pretty much the only other artist in that working in that register with whom she was prepared to associate effectively. Um, I also learned uh, how closely Kolbitz was associated with Max Wertheimer, founder of the Gestalt School of Perception, which forms the background to much of the empathy theory that I will be exploring. Um, so, to begin, uh, one of the uh, very few personal encounters between Els Bala and Kate Colbitz took place in the former studio at Gustavel in Mecklenburg in October 1938. Colbitz had travelled from Berlin for the wake after Bala's death. On return, she executed a mournful sketch of the gaunt figure in his coffin, reflecting in her diary on his diminished form and how much he had suffered in recent years. Yet at the same time, she remarked how his work had never seemed so large and compact in its expression as it did to her on that encounter. And indeed, amongst the sculptures in the studio which made for a substantial presence was the bronze head of the famous Gustavo Memorial, universally as taking on Kolditz's own likeness, the head of the angel figure had been cast separately in addition to the main work. It seems odd, perhaps, um, that despite mentioning this work, she made no comment on her likeness here. However, the weight of evidence for what has been called the collaborative conversation between the two artists means it is likely that she would have felt the contrast in volumes, the gulf between the fullness of the sculptor's work and his fragile body, ready to herself from the physical world. She would have been acutely aware of another significant absence, too, that the Angel Memorial had the year before been removed from its place in the cathedral by Nazi officials. The lamentation, probably begun the following day, attests to the substantial impact of that visit, after which, as the same diary entry relates, she found herself, quotes, in an expansive frame of mind, unquote, feeling, she wrote, as if Bala has given me his blessing. A fragment in relief, such as might appear on a gravestone, it depicts the burden of grief witnessed by both artists over the years in an ancient melancholia motif. Behind the two hands that clasp the face, half to conceal, half in support, we see the familiar contours of a self-portrait that reflects an individual and a universal pain one person's death reflected in the face of another is the assessment of Elmar Janssen, original director of the Bala Foundation in the GDR. Eyes closed, voice silenced, yet the hand over the mouth serves to amplify the outcry in the perception of the beholder, as we sense the effort of maintaining composure in face of injustices that were multiple. So what has been said about this family likeness despite sparse relations? Contemporaries would make the connection in both content and form, one that without an overt expressionism yet overcame convention by spanning realism and formal simplification. In his book on the reciprocal relationship, between the two, Janssen cited amongst various commonalities, for instance, an antipathy to the bourgeois art world and, of course, to the regime of the late 1930s. Underlining those decades of mutual regard, Janssen wrote how, without ever, ever fully becoming close, they met each other halfway in what he called a shared gravitational field. 
Conceivably, that statement also defines the emotional and physical weight of their two oeuvres, which trade in archetypes of formal integrity. Solid figures with simple, bold contours and an active emotional core. Whether or not the depiction suggests motion, the viewer is arguably moved by this unity of form and content. To investigate this, to ask what affected Kate Colvitz, is to enter the territory of visual empathy. The various art historical applications of this term cover a spectrum from archetypes of cultural memory to the physiological mechanisms of perception. An example of the first that undoubtedly has potential for Barlach and Kolwitz is the pathos formula or pathos formel first conceived by their contemporary Abi Barburg. With an emphasis both on the outer contours and an emotional core of potential energy, as he described it, this term denotes the means by which salient forms migrate across time to resonate again in a new cultural context. Time is limited here, so I will just briefly define this before moving on. Um, best summed up in the words of philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who writes that the pathos formula can be regarded as an indissoluble intertwining of an emotional charge and an iconographic formula in which it is impossible to distinguish between form and content. At the opposite extreme, research into mirror neurons in the premotor cortex of primate brains has brought a theory of what is called embodied simulation. As applied by art historian David Friedberg, for instance, this hypothesis extends beyond iconographic factors to suggest that we also react to the gestural trace in abstract works, especially powerful in cases of vigorous material handling. A recent study uh, by art historian Ladislav Kessner acknowledges a multi-level process of affective response that occurs reciprocally across this spectrum by means of affective elements or affordances that correspond to components of an image and its cultural associations. Such factors, therefore, would range from the macrotemporal level of Warburg's formula to the microtemporal precognitive workings of perception. Even on the latter level, there is evidence that individual psychology and collective historical experience influence ways of seeing. I won't blind you with science beyond that, but to embed ourselves just a little bit more in empathy theory, it first appeared in the border work of Robert Fisher and his essay entitled On the Optical Feeling for Form of 1873. This explored the idea of a dynamic perception that actively feels itself into the object world, and the German term there is Einfühlung. Thus, with reference, for instance, to a weeping willow, he wrote how, quotes, an objective but accidentally experienced phenomenon always provokes a related idea of the self in sensory or motor form. Along with inheritors of this idea in the 20th century was the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Applying his research on embodied perception to the artistic practice of Paul Cézanne, amongst others, Merleau-Ponty considered how a viewer of the paintings might experience sensations parallel to those experienced by the artist at work. His system of exchanges, as he calls them, begins with the sensibility of the artist who, as Meloponti describes it, lends their body to the world, and in so doing, transmits an internal equivalent of that world through the work itself. We will note, I think, the physiological register when Meloponti asks further, why shouldn't these correspondences in turn give rise to some tracing rendered visible again, in which the eyes of others could find an underlying motif to sustain their inspection of the world? 
there appear, thus there appears a visible to the second power, a carnal essence or icon of the first. Through an examination of the woodcut practice of Barlach and Colbitz, I shall argue here for a similar system of exchanges. Already an established sculptor, dramatist and lithographer, Ernst Barlach took up woodcut printing in the closing months of the First World War in order, as he wrote, not to fall apart. The context was one of both material shortages and depleted emotional circumstances. Peopled with trouble types, struggling with the elements, his, the stark themes of faith and fallibility are echoed in the uncompromising formal conditions. His first work, Der Kopf, consisted of illustrations to an epic poem by Russian prisoner of war, Reinhold von Walter, about a world turned upside down under the rule of a despotic, disabled beggar. And here is the eponymous head, held aloft on a pedestal in front of an imploring crowd. Such beggar figures first appeared in Barak's work after a formative journey through the Russian steppes, today's Ukraine, in 1906. Here is where we see him in Merleau-Ponty's world lend his body to the world. Recalling in his diary how immediately he recognized what he called the plastic reality of the world about him, the rolling landscape inhabited by the bulky forms of peasants and ancient stone figures, he wrote, look, it is the same outside as in, it is all real beyond measure. The new compact unity that marks his work from this point, acknowledged by Colwitz in her comment cited above, translates explicitly into the woodcuts with their striking symmetry of themes <coughs> and expression. As the pictorial elements are concentrated by material necess necessity into a tight web of salient line and rhythmic space with no grey areas, the result underpins the urgent plight of human beings in adverse conditions. It was demanding work, physically and emotionally. On completion of seven large sheets in late 1919, Barlach wrote to his cousin, I'd almost like to entice you to try the woodcut. It is a technique that forces a confession, compels one to say in no uncertain terms what one really needs. What does he mean by this and how does it register in our perception? The central work of Christ in Gethsemane offers some answers. Barlach scholars have established in this work an amalgam uh, of postures from Christian conventions of the Passion, in, especially in works by Hans Holbein the Elder, uh, a print of Christ carrying the cross, for instance, and by Albrecht Dürer, Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Analyzing the formal structure of the work, we observe first the unifying effect of a plastic surface rhythm that incorporates the central figure with the contorted landscape of the Mount of Olives, olives where sleeping apostles are enfolded in the exposed roots of the trees, mirroring elements from the collapsed body of Christ. If we close in, and I'll just this. Oops. If we close in on that central figure, on the heavy drapery folds and their counterparts in the deeply lined face and hands clasped one over the other, one, if one feels there something of that weighty rhythm, then according to empathy theorist um, Robert Fisher, and his original writing, this is because when viewing the world, as he wrote, I wrap myself in its contours as in a garment. Kater Kolditz's series, War, Krieg, published in 1922 and 3, is the distillation of a long struggle to commemorate the death of her younger son Peter in October 1914, barely 10 days after he first left for the front. Initially, she embarked on a sculptural memorial before becoming frustrated with the conventional form and lack of substance. 
Where is the new form for the content of these recent years, she asked in some despair. After years of painful searching, she sub subsequently began work on a graphic cycle, only to abandon, in, in turn, first etching and then lithograph. Then, in June 1920, she saw Barlach's woodcuts in an exhibition at the Secession and immediately recognised a form that would be adequate to the content. Declaring herself bowled over by the encounter, she had to acknowledge that lithography wasn't adequate to the strength of feeling. Barlach has found his way and I have not yet found mine, she wrote. As it depicts the suffering of those on the home front, the war series also maps a shift in the artist's attitudes to the conflict. As she put it herself, quote, it begins in glory and ends in utter darkness. Thus, the first sheet depicts a heroic sacrifice. A woman, vulnerable in her nakedness, offers her newborn child in service to the great cause. This and the volunteers are faithful to the patriotic spirit which swept <coughs> Peter and his friends into the arms of death, and that is um, the figure of death there is, uh, is her son Peter. Using minimum means for maximum effect, the stark material choices have condensed these band of brothers into a single ecstatic wave suspended under a rainbow ideal, feet not touching the ground. Sheet three of the grieving parents is the crystallization of a shift in attitudes and formal solutions in, observed in drawings and other sculptural models. And here there's a lengthy but really significant backstory to uh, the eventual memorial that is to be created. Um, no time to go into that here. Supporting each other in their sorrow, hands standing in for hidden faces, the fused figures create a new monument to replace the abandoned plaster model. The parents who in that earlier composition had stood at head and foot of the outstretched body, much like the lamentation uh, conventions that Dot was showing in fact, um, are now united in the son's notable absence into one immutable block, one that might stand in for a headstone the solid relief chiselled against an empty background and overlaid with sparse white lines. Placed towards the end of the series, the mothers stamps an impression of resolute defiance on our perception. The impenetrable weave of women, those voluble hands clasping a single protective cloak around their precious children, represent both an emotional containment and a new confidence in the expression. Finally, as Colbitz remarked on completion of the series, she had found the means to express what all had suffered, as she said, throughout those unspeakably difficult years. One might observe here how the woodcut has returned her to her centre of gravity. For both Barlach and Colbitz, a study of the original printing matrices brings us closer to the demands of this physically resistant medium, including, I think, the mental agility entailed in the process of reversal and reduction. To withstand a greater print run, Colbitz's woodblocks were faced with copper and then recast as zinc plates through a process of electrolysis, which is, explains the um, appearance here. Looking at the plate of the mothers, the act of excavation is evident. Every mark a deliberate decision, no covering up for mistakes without having to start the whole process again. Arguably, the inverted material surface contains a gestural trace of the emotional force that defines this work. Evidently, the artist found strength in the productive engagement. She might still be afraid of working in sculpture, as her diary states at that time. However, since embarking on the woodcut, she felt she could see, quotes, all sorts of potential. Continuing that it was even possible con to conceive of creating this work one day as a sculpture in the round. As with other woodblocks preserved in the Barlach archive in Goustrow, the graceful ribs and gleaming hollows of the Christ block 
show the mastery of an accomplished sculptor working in a tight-grained fruit wood. Unlike the excised mass of Colbert's example, Barlach's composition takes up the entire surface, playing out in a remarkably rhythmic whole. Again, we are aware that each line on the printed surface is the result of an exacting process to create a tight web of raised bars shored up from beneath to concentrate the material weight in the act of printing. I would suggest that a view of the printing blocks reveals certain constitutive elements that underpin the viewer's response to the finished print. These elements correspond to uh, particular elements of empathy theory uh, and may indeed help us to, um, may help to elucidate Barlach's um, point, for instance, about working in this medium being akin to a confession. Certainly, the productive response from Colvitz attests to a convincing transaction. Elmar, in Elmar Jackson's view, it gave Colvitz the courage for a concentration of massive form, simple contours, reduction of clothing and surface to essentials. I'm coming to my final slides here. Uh, and that uh, statement, I think, makes a good description of the ultimate memorial that took form after she prized those grieving parents apart again. When originally erected in 1932, the figures flanked the entrance to the cemetery at Roggenfeld in Belgium. Here, the arrangement of substance and space accentuated the absence of the son's body, an absence felt by visitors who passed between the, the pair to confront their own loss amongst countless graves laid out before them. Isolated in their personal pain, yet united in the compact volumes that shape them from within, the parents' introversion keeps the viewer at a respectful distance, while also inviting a reciprocal introspection. Barlach's Gustro Angel was completed in 1927, just as Colovitz was getting to work again on her memorial. Based on the adoption of his fellow artist's face, Barlach insisted that this came to him quite unintentionally, acknowledging nonetheless that she was certainly worthy of the honour. Janssen regarded the two memorials as a collaborative work, and he employs an explicitly empathic register, I think, when he writes how each one had, quotes, felt their self into the victorial concept of the other. We might extend that concept to the way each work trades in the distribution of space and substance. If the grieving parents makes one feel the gulf between the two volumes, with the age of the sense is, what is one of gravitational contradiction, the obvious material weight of the bronze figure dematerialized by the hovering stance a couple of meters above the floor. I would like to say observed here is a concept equals quotes vision comes about in the object unquote the image created is not a secondary thing but contains always a texture of the real the artwork is the inside of the outside and the outside of the inside he said. Not only did Barlach observe precisely this when he made that breakthrough in Russia, but Colbitz would indeed quote him when she wrote in a memorial statement that, and as in his own words, it is both inside and outside. Form and content are identical. One of the most powerful manifestations of this is in the Tower of Mothers, the result of her tentative ambition to sculpt again. When, in fact, on return from Balak's wake that October, she reported on the burst of productivity, it was in part due to her satisfaction on finding in her studio the first bronze cast of this work. By now, the subject had returned with a new urgency at the prospect of another generation of youth being sent to war, her own grandchild among them. We feel them here like the kernel of a nut within the powerful mass, visible to the second power. Thank you. I think there's going to be a lot to talk about in the panel um, to follow. Um, but first, 
um, let me introduce Christian Weikhoff. He's a professor in modern and contemporary German art at the University of Edinburgh. His research focuses on both pre- and post-war, uh, post-1945 German art, from Expressionism and Dada to Gerhard Richter, George Baslitz, and Sammy Kiefer, and Joseph Boys. He's contributed widely to edited volumes and exhibition catalogs, and his most recent book, This Strategy, Get Arts, 35 Artists Who Broke the Rules on the Takeover of Edinburgh College of Art by artists associated with the Dusseldorf scene. He's also series editor for Peter Land's German Visual Culture, a book series. His paper today is The Arboreal Expressionism of Carl Schmidt Rothblatt. Please welcome Christian. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, before I begin to say a few words about uh, Schumann, I've been aware of Schumann's work on German art going way back to the early 1990s. And like Dot, I was at Essex University. Sadly, I missed Schumann by about three years. She'd already moved to the courthold in 1990. Uh, but her reputation went before her, so I, 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 I got to know about her very quickly from Peter Virgo and others. Um, and uh, I had the honor of hosting her much later on in 2005 for the centenary conference for the Brucker. Uh, and she contributed a brilliant essay, I have to say, to the edited volume that arose from that conference. Uh, Robin showed you the cover of that book earlier earlier on. Everything she did was brilliant, in fact. Um, and subsequently, we shared a platform at the Museum of Modern Art in New York um, for a research seminar connected to an exhibition organized by Star Figura. And that was an exhibition called Expressionism, the Graphic Impulse. And Schumann was also very much the star of my Radio 3 documentary on Kandinsky. Uh, and I had the pleasure of interviewing her in the Courthouse Galleries in 2016. I also had the privilege of examining two of her PhD students, both of whom are here today and giving, giving papers, uh, Nicola and, and Lucy. Uh, in short, Schumann was an absolutely wonderfully warm person, a super intelligent woman, a great scholar, and I'm so pleased that we're here today to celebrate her life and work. Um, so I'll begin. More woodcuts, I'm afraid. Some <laughs> of you haven't had enough woodcuts already. Um, so, this paper is called uh, The Arboreal Expressionism of Carl Schmidt Rothbard. This is an old school paper for me. It goes back to my early interest in pre 1945 expressionism. These days I tend to work more on post 45 German art. Uh, but I've sneaked one post 45 German artist into this paper as well to make a connection. I'll begin. Um, Whilst a love of wood as material and the forest as place is, of course, not exclusively confined to Germany, many have argued that it has been far more pronounced in German culture and society than elsewhere, and that the history of the German forest and the development of a German national consciousness go together. But by 1900, the forest glade or oak grove, replete with all its national ideological associations, had become so well established in the German visual canon, it was almost an overused motif. Karl Schmidt Rodloff uh, was a core member of the Brücke, in English bridge, circle of artists, constituting that first flourish of what was later defined as expressionism. And the Brücke frequently represented the wood or forest in their work, often as a backdrop to their free body culture. What the Brücke understood uh, was that they could not simply reproduce cliched subject matter if they were to develop an authentic form of visual language. In defining their new German art, they went beyond the arboreal imagery evident in Northern Renaissance prints and paintings, or indeed the romantic paintings of Caspar David Friedrich and his followers. By stressing the grain, age rings, and the irregularities of timber in their woodcut and wood carving, it could be argued that they were attempting to shift the matrix of cultural nationalism from the wood or forest as national symbol to wood as artistic material. Carl Schmidt Rockwell's fascination with trees and the artistic possibilities of the raw material of wood can be traced back to his earliest woodcuts. Trees in winter, 
looks like an even more abstract version of a woodcut by his fellow Broca member Fritz Breyer, also showing a winter scene. <coughs> or it might be a response to Japanese-inspired woodcuts with an arboreal theme by Vienna secession artists such as Karl Moll and Karl Müller, whose work they had seen in Versacrum, the organ of the Vienna secession, which they read avidly as students. In addition, the inspiration of Japanese printmaking, particularly the work of Hiroshiga, can be seen in schmidt rottler's Bridge woodcuts of 1905. It would, however, be incorrect to state that these works were simply derivative. Through their intense contrast of black, of black and white, and through the stark but expressive rendering of bridge structures, schmidt rottler also signaled the way forward for the Baraka beyond their appreciation of Jugendstil and their understanding of Japanese technique effectively creating strong symbols of group identity through his relief printmaking in the very year of the group's formation. schmidt Wattluff made no woodcuts at all in 1907 uh, and 8, but his woodcuts of 1909 to 11 that utilized the grain of the block and exposed chip carving in the overall composition, or composition owe much to Edvard Munch's printmaking technique while achieving perhaps even a greater simplification of form. And until 1913, as Rosa Shapira noted in her catalog raisonne of schmidt rottluff's graphic work, the artist printed all his own woodcuts and continued to explore the surface of the woodblock to create texture and depth. The motif of the tree became increasingly important to schmidt rottluff as he experimented in his graphic work, particularly in the woodcut medium. The art historian Robin Reisenfeld has argued that schmidt rottluff used the wood grain in his prints to express an organic relationship. She writes, as a byproduct, the image created from the woodblock became an extension of his experience of nature. This sense of oneness with trees and natural surroundings can be seen in woodcuts such as Woman in the Woods, which might be seen as an expressionist updating of Caspar David Friedrich's forest romanticism one of several Friedrich-inspired prints from this year, for which schmidt rottluff deployed Friedrich's Rückenfigur device. The art of the Brücke often exemplified a male gaze sexual utopianism. Even after the group's disbandment in 1913, schmidt rottluff produced woodcuts of an erotic nature. Towards the end of the war, however, there was a shift in emphasis from sexually charged representations of courtesans in studio settings to a more sobering religious imagery. This was in keeping with the emergence during this period of what has been referred to as messianic expressionism, a phenomenon that went hand in hand with a newfound appreciation of the emotive work of that Northern Renaissance artist, Matthias Grunewald, and in particular, his Isenheim Alpenpiece. Um, one might argue that Ernst Barlach shown by Nicola was also part of that phenomenon of messianic expressionism. Rosa Shapira was uh, schmidt rottluff's most loyal supporter and avid collector, a figure about whom Schumann Baer was a world-leading authority. After the war, Shapira co-edited and contributed to two Weimar-era expressionist journals, Die Rote Ära and Kundung. Shapira wrote an important article on schmidt rottluffs religious woodcuts for Die Rote Ära in which she proposed that the artist was the greatest exponent of this messianic aspect of expressionism, as conveyed through his wood culture. She waxed lyrical about his ability to find new aspects in age-old materials, and she argued the innermost secrets of the soul are disclosed in black and white, in line and surface. His creations are not illustrative, illustrative but new interpretations of Christ's words. Intriguingly, <clears throat> at this time, the biblical word was often appropriated by patriotic German art critics and commentators in order to describe the cultural achievement of the expressionist woodcut. For example, in writing about the Hans Goltz exhibition, Der Expressionistische Holschnitt in 1918, which displayed a number of woodcuts with religious subject matter, including those by schmidt rottluff the poet Rudolf Adrian Dietrich would state, the simplest medium, the woodblock, is enough. Each cut of the knife is a cut into the inner self. This wood is indeed flesh of thy flesh. And in 1920, taking a, a different approach, but also reflecting on Schmidt-Rottluff's use of wood, 
the critic Wilhelm Valentina interpreted the German sensitivity to organic, organic craft material in terms that revealed a strong cultural nationalism. Uh, and Valentina wrote, it is <coughs> as if the structure of the rough trunk in its knotty, misshapen shape that nevertheless submits to the passionate carving knife were especially suited to the half barbaric, half sentimental, self-sacrificing German character. An unconscious <coughs> racial instinct also motivated schmidt Rottluff, who turned with passion towards these activities. Quite an extraordinary passage, that. It is also worth observing that the wood had earlier been celebrated by a revitalized German arts and crafts movement as a symbolic bastion against other work materials that had been introduced in the process of industrialization. Moreover, this emphasis on the authenticity of traditional hand craftsmanship was somewhat at odds with the Kaiser's own faith in technological industrial progress in the formation of a new Germany. Like his uh, Brucker colleague, Schmidt Rottluff produced handcrafted wooden furniture for his Atelier Wohnung in Berlin Friedenau and started to experiment with other forms of wood carving. His relief with two female nudes from 1911 is a notable example. As Gerhard Witek has pointed out, there is clearly some interrelationship between this wood relief and woodcuts such as nudes on a rug too. In this respect, the work seems to have grown out of the woodcut but stops short of the three-dimensionality of wood sculpture. It is also suggestive of those wood best reliefs created by Paul Gauguin in Tahiti during the late 1880s, as well as referencing the simplified figuration evident on the parallel wood beams, which Schmidt-Rodolf would have seen in the, in the Dresden Ethnographic Museum some time before the group moved to Berlin. schmidt Rodolf's wood relief is striking in that two stylized female nudes formed from flat painted surfaces appear to be breaking free from a mass of rough, almost petrified bark. Their action is framed by the much smoother outer surfaces of the block, which also feature engraved but uneven parallel lines. The work simultaneously expresses the artist's submission to and overcoming of the resistance of the organic material. The act of looking at the raised and subtracted surfaces stimulates a vicarious experience as we mentally reconstruct the physical strain of the activity that brought the relief into existence. The creative interaction between different media in schmidt Watler's experimentation with wood is noteworthy. And similarly to political colleagues Eric Heckel and Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, his motifs often developed through a series of medial transformations. In his sketch for a sculpture from 1912 that you see here, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner effectively illustrates a key aspect of what I've defined as arboreal expressionism. The pencil and chalk sketch depicts a naked male and female contained by two tree branches. The shapes of the branches dictate their forms, but they appear to be breaking out as if at the end of a metamorphic cycle. Kirchner stated evocatively, it is such a sensual pleasure, pleasure when blow by blow, the figure grows more and more from the trunk. There is a figure in every trunk. One must only peel it out. In their unique studio's culture, the Baruch artists really took up an anti-academic position by carving figures out of raw wood and using intense color that appeared to seep out of the fibrous material, they were challenging the prevailing notion of the aesthetic purity and superiority of white marble classical sculpture, an idea first developed during the Enlightenment, principally by Johann Winkelmann, an idea which dominated the art academies of Europe even as late as the first half of the 20th century. This rejection of the marmorial <laughs> academic tradition through expressing a relationship to both tribal African and oceanic wood carving, as well as to their native Gothic wood sculpture tradition, is significant. Critical supporters of the Brücke, and particularly those based in Hamburg, such as Gustav Schiefler, Max Sauerland, Wilhelm Niemeyer, and Shapira, all recognized this important aspect of their art. Sauerland, who was director of the Museum für Kunst und Gewerbe in Hamburg, went so far as to argue that it was the Brücke's method of non-concealment, of revealing tool marks and arboreal material in the work of art itself, that made them even more authentic than the medieval woodcarvers at the heart of the Germanic artistic tradition. A series of schmidt Wattler's woodcut self-portraits produced between 1913 and 1914 focus on heads, as does a 1915 woodcut portrait of Shapiro, although a number of these represented heads imply three-dimensionality, and in this respect can be seen as imaginative preparatory studies that signal his progression from relief carving to the fully sculptural. Between 1911 and 1912, schmidt Wattler produced a few highly distinctive mask-like wood reliefs of bearded men. 
These look vaguely tribal, but are not as indebted to African and oceanic prototypes as some of his later three-dimensional head sculptures. These wood reliefs, you see one here on the left, cannot be regarded as crafted in any conventional sense, as the wood blocks are left more or less in their original state. The natural physical presence of these blocks is manifest, and ancient faces, reminiscent of historical images of wood woses, appear to emerge from the arboreal surface with the minimal intervention of tools. Later on, uh, on a, a military post into Lithuania in 1916, <coughs> Schmidt Rubler found himself surrounded by ancient forests. Here, he took his raw artistic material directly from its source. He deeply admired the use of wood as a craft material by the native population, although it is notable that Schmidt Rottler's work appears to be relatively uninfluenced by local wood carving. <laughs> Instead, he produced many head sculptures which seem to have been conceived from his appreciation of African prototypes, or indeed echo Polynesian forms, in that they often possess the appearance of scaled down versions of giant Easter Island figures. <clears throat> Wilhelm Niemeyer was one of the first art historians to underline the significance of wood as an artistic material in the oeuvre of Schmidt Rottluff. In the utopian uh, journal Kundung, Herald, which he co edited with Shapira and which was printed in a workshop of the Hamburg Kunstgewebenschule, he even dedicated a Waldli to the artist, articulating the importance of the tree, wood as material, and forest in his work. It should be noted that, the cre that creative writing on trees and forests has a long history in German literature, and poems on the forest still appealed in the early 20th century, often published in journals by writers associated with literary expressionism. The enthusiasm of Schmidt, Rottluff, and Niemeyer for all things arboreal might therefore also be seen in this context, together with the tradition of celebrating the arboreal in German visual culture. The kinship of the forest to the German people was repeatedly stressed later on in national socialist doctrine. Heinrich Himmler's Ancestral Inheritance Foundation, a Nazi think tank which was set up in 1935, even had a special department of 100 men dedicated to researching the place of the forest and tree in German culture and history. The National Socialists were keen to encourage a Waldbefust sign of forest consciousness. The nationalistic appreciation of the wood in terms of place and material appeared in many publications, such as Franz Mammon's The Forest as Educator and Hubert Schrader's Tree and Forest. Furthermore, Hans Weber, writing for the Nazi publication Die Kunst im Deutschen Reich in April 1940, argued, only the Nordic race has achieved such perfection in the treatment of wood, and only it possesses such a decided feeling for the beauties that lie in the material, in the grain and color of the various kinds of wood. This cultural nationalism was perhaps not so very different from the rhetoric of Weimar era supporters of expressionism. But while national socialist art history was shot through with eugenic theories, earlier critical endorsers of expressionist wood culture, such as Valentina, Niemeyer, and Sauerland, were not opposed to the wood carving from Cameroon and South Sea Islands that inspired powerful emotional, emotional statements in modern German art. Hans Weber's Nazi propagandist sense of cultural patriotism meant that he deliberately omitted from his discussion any other nation whose people had worked with wood, and especially the corpus of wooden objects from Belgium, France, and, uh, the, German, and, the, French, and the German colonies, well, sorry, eulogized by modernists such as the influential German Jewish writer Karl Einstein. Einstein nonetheless used the racist terminology that was so commonplace in this period, even among progressive leftists, as you can see here in this well-known publication from 1915. Weber's celebration of German arts and crafts carefully avoided any mention of the expressionist woodcut and wood sculpture, which was viewed by many national socialists as un-German and highly degenerate, precisely because of its indebtedness to Cameroonian and South Sea Island uh, tribal artifacts a connection that had been articulated in earlier Weimar-era exhibitions. Schmidt Rotluff, for instance, was the headliner artist for a Kessner Gesellschaft exhibition in 1920, in which his artworks were juxtaposed with ethnographic objects. The cover of the Hanover catalogue clearly attempted to capitalize on the success of Einstein's book in artist circles. Schmidt Rotluff's woodcuts and wood sculpture fell firmly into the Nazi category of degenerate, the network of Jewish patronage for the likes of Schmidt Rotluff was deemed conspiratorial, and Jewish dealers, collectors, and curators were all accused by the Nazis of contaminating 
eugenically pure Germanic culture by seducing German artists into seeing the world unnaturally. Totally ridiculous argument. There you are. The Nazis pointed to the distortions and deform deformations of the human figure in expressionist art as evidence of this unnaturalness. Rudolf Hermann's poster for the Hamburg Intatete Kunst Degenerate Art Exhibition played on different aspects of the notion of, of degenerate. The narrow eyes and elongated nose of the imagined head, head sculpture negatively refers to un-German influences which inspired the likes of Schmidt Rotloff, as well as attacking Jewish support for expressionism. The anti-Semitic aspect is drawn out by the fact that Hermann's fictive head sculpture is curiously reminiscent of Otto Dix's unflattering portrait of the Jewish art dealer Alfred Flechtheim and is shadowed, far less subtly, by a Shylock-like character. In 1934, during the era of National Socialism, Kaltschmidt Rodolf painted his uprooted trees, signalling a disturbance in Germany. One might ask, was it the artist himself who felt uprooted? In the post-war period, the artist Georg Baselitz further explored the idea of the tree, broken and bleeding, as a symbol for a Germany turned upside down by historical events, the nurturing locale of so much German romantic painting now seemingly ruptured. In the mid-1960s, Baselitz became one of the first German artists to emphatically take up the woodcut again, effectively renewing the medium that was so associated with Expressionism and the Baroque style, and that revealed much of the woodblock's organic irregularities in the gouged composition. But it would be inaccurate to consider Baselitz's woodcuts exclusively in relation to first-generation Expressionism. Like his predecessor Otto Dix, Baselitz was also drawn to Italian mannerism, to the work of Pontormo and Bronzino, as well as 16th-century woodcuts by northern mannerist artists. In West Germany, the careers of the surviving Brucker artists were restored in the post-war period. These artists, who had formed a rebellious avant-garde group in Dresden in 1905, and who often took up emphatic anti-academic stances during the Wilhelmine era, had by the 1950s become respectable elder statesmen of the arts establishment, and were hardly influential on a younger generation. Baslitz has confirmed this in an interview with me although he has also stated that he felt a certain dependence on his fellow Saxon artist, Schmidt Rodloff, and he has portrayed him in single or group, group portraits many times since the 1980s. And I'll just read what he said here on the screen uh, about Schmidt Rodloff, um, and I'm coming to my last slide in a moment. Baselitz wrote, Schmidt Rodloff was an expressionist and one of the few in Germany who survived the war with a painting ban. He was a professor in the school in West Berlin where I was a student. I was not in his class, but he was around and I talked to him. I wondered why such a famous artist did not have any backing. Nobody paid any attention to him, and he had hardly any students. He was totally unfashionable. If it wasn't for the fact that he'd gifted many works to the city of Berlin in the late 1960s, which formed the basis of the Brucker Museum, nobody would have seen his work. The market for schmidt rottluff only came later. But there was a reason why Schmidt Rotluff was ignored by the others. That was simply that we had lost the war, and the writers, philosophers, and artists, and musicians of that period were all somehow implicated. Whether they were opponents of the regime or not, didn't matter. Georg Baselitz. Um, like the Brugger artists, Baselitz collected African wood carving, through, although rather more extensively, one has to say, maintaining a particular interest in Lobby, Bateba, and ancestral woodcarved figures from the Bateka tribe in the Republic of Congo, as Shulamit Baer has identified. And you might be interested to know that Shulamit published on Baselitz for the catalogue of the Royal Academy retrospective in 2007. Everybody knows her work on the women artists of expressionism, maybe not so much her work on Baselitz. Baselitz's own wood sculpture reveals a surface that has been roughly hewn directly from the trunk with chainsaws and axes an expression of his desire for what he calls raw primordial form. Baselitz has argued that when one thinks of primordial form <laughs> sculpture, one always thinks of sculpture from Africa. There is no doubt that, like Kierkegaard and schmidt Rolf before him, Baselitz is fascinated by the idea of the recurrence of ancestral traits, especially as suggested by cutting through the growth rings of arboreal material in wood carving. And like them, 
his atavistic impulses have not been exclusively localized on German identity. He is an artist who is delighted in giving new growth to old wood. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really, really, really very talk. The fourth speaker in um, this session is Dr. Mike Altin Q, reader in art history at the University of Essex. His research largely focuses on issues of spectatorship and modern and contemporary art and visual culture. And his writings include his monograph, Nazi Exhibition Design and <coughs> Modernism from 2018, and a series of articles in the Art Bulletin, Art History, <coughs> Journal of Design History, and, from, and the Oxford Art Journal. His paper today is Art in Exile, uh, Ludwig Minder, and Holocaust uh, Knowledge. Welcome, Michael. Before beginning, I should uh, like to thank Robin and Glenn for the kind invitation to take part in uh, what has thus far been a fascinating program. I came to know Shulamit Baer's work uh, before I knew much about the history of art. It was 2005, while I was a rather clueless MA student with minimal training in art history. Um, at that point, one of my professors recommended her introductory book, Expressionism, for anyone with little familiarity with the movement, which was certainly the case for me. While this text provided me a useful entry point into Expressionism, much like it has for many undergrad students to whom I now regularly assign this book, it was Bear's writing about Ludwig Meidner's Art in Exile that perhaps most shaped my own research and approach to German art by providing a model for thinking through the stakes of art made in response to the Holocaust. Here, I'm referring to a trio of essays that Bear wrote in the last decade of her life that discussed the Holocaust-related works of Meidner, an artist who, in 1939, fled to Berlin, or Berlin, to Britain, uh, where the artist remained for almost a decade after World War II. In many respects, Bear's interest in Meidner's work is not especially surprising. After all, not only did it dovetail with her own research and teaching interests in the work of exiled artists, it also exemplified a wider interest among art historians and curators in the work of artists in exile during the National Socialist period. Within this larger field of inquiry, Bear was hardly the only scholar or curator to have explored Meidner's work in exile. Nevertheless, she did offer an unusually nuanced account of this work with a particular emphasis on how such art revealed what she terms, quote, the different textures and methods that constitute Holocaust knowledge, end quote. In my talk today, I wish to explore Bear's approach for teasing out such different textures and methods, which I do by considering the link between the role of Holocaust knowledge in Miner's art and the concept of traumatic realism, to which Bear refers in two essays about the artist's work in exile. As I'll propo propose in what follows, Bear's writing on Meidner casts attention to the formidable challenges associated with his artistic attempt to develop what he called a realistic response to the Holocaust at the very moment when knowledge about its horrors was becoming publicly disseminated in Britain and other allied countries. Perhaps just as importantly, because Bear considered not only Miner's own response to such knowledge, but also the way that he sought to address spectators through his art, her writing reveals how such works function as catalysts for Holocaust knowledge. Above all, by inviting audiences to think more critically and reflectively about its traumatic events as they were unfolding over real time. For those less familiar with Miner's work in exile, a few basic points are worth mentioning at the outset. Meidner, who was Jewish, fled Germany in August 1939 for England, where he arrived in London. Not long thereafter, he was interned between 1940 and 1941, initially at a Liverpool transit camp, and then on the Isle of Man in Hutchinson, 
the site of a camp for many so-called enemy aliens, often known as the artist camp, given the concentration of artists living there, uh, most of whom were Jewish. In late 1942, roughly a year after his release from the internment camp in Hutchinson, Meiner settled in Berlin, where he began a cycle of works titled Suffering of the Jews in Poland. As Baer notes, although considerable uncertainty still surrounds the, quote, quantity, dating, and sequencing, end quote, of these watercolors and drawings, what remains incontestable was Meidner's attempt to use this cycle as an artistic response to the massacres of Jews in Nazi-occupied Poland. As Meidner explained in a 1943 letter written soon after beginning the cycle, one of the most central challenges of this artistic response was, quote, to strike a balance, end quote, so the works remained again in his words, faithful and clear, without glossing over anything. At the same time, he wanted to avoid them being, as he put it, sensationalistic or exaggeratedly stark. The solution, Meitner elaborate, elaborated, was to, quote, depict the tragic, uh, tragedy realistically, even if bursts of mysticism sporadically broke, broke through. For example, through works uh, that depicted biblical figures, uh, as we see here. Uh, as, Meyer, as Meitner explained, such occasional moments of what he called mysticism loosely recalled the work of William Blake, with whom the German artist envisioned a kinship. Given Meitner's stated attempt to depict the health, uh, tragedy of the Holocaust realistically, or as he put it in German, ganz realistisch, Baer, perhaps not surprisingly, turned to the concept of traumatic realism as a lens for analyzing Meitner's cycle. Coined in 2000 by literature and memory studies scholar Michael Rothberg, the notion of traumatic realism was meant to, quote, provide an aesthetic and cognitive solution to the conflicting demands in representing and understanding genocide, end quote. And here I borrow um, Rothberg's words. As he elaborated, Traumatic realism centers on, quote, how the ordinary and extraordinary aspects of genocide intersect and co coexist, thus mediating between the realistic and anti-realistic <laughs> positions that have often defined Holocaust studies, end quote. In several respects, Baer's decision to invoke Rothberg's concept of dramatic realism when writing about Miner's Holocaust-related works makes sense. For one thing, Traumatic realism seems like rather a natural fit with the artist's stated intention to depict the tragedy of the Holocaust realistically. And on a more historiographic level, the concept of traumatic realism emerged as a key reference point in much scholarship about the visual culture of the Holocaust in the decades after Rothberg's account, in no small measure because of the challenges inherent in accounting for what he called the everyday aspects of the Holocaust and their intersection with the genocide's extreme nature. Yet what remains insightful about Baer's engagement with traumatic realism was less her decision to engage with this concept too cool, but more the care with which she examined how Meitner sought to depict the tragedy realistically. As Baer notes, even if Meidner may have created the cycle at a relatively safe remove from such atrocities, he considered it a moral imperative of sorts to depict these traumatic events in, um, quote, faithfully and clear, without glossing over anything, end quote. The rub, of course, was just how to do this, given the incomplete nature of Meidner's knowledge about the Holocaust. For Meidner embarked on this series in late 1942, less than a year after the National Socialist implementation of the so-called Final Solution, the details of which were not fully known at the time, especially by members of the general public. Although Weidner may have been operating with a less than complete knowledge of the Holocaust while working on this cycle, Baer convincingly demonstrates that there was quite a bit he did know as an exiled artist in Britain. One source of knowledge was the 1940 book the German Invasion of Poland, which included extensive photographs of this invasion. Another was the evidence gathered by um, the Polish resistance and Polish government in exile, which had formed the basis of an address to 
the United Nations in December 1942, that right around this time was published as a book. Yet another source was a uh, speech by the British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs delivered to Parliament in December 1942 that elaborated on Poland's role as, quote, the principal Nazi, Nazi slaughterhouse of Jews, end quote. A speech that had a very strong effect on Meitner, who wrote about it in a letter shortly thereafter, as Baer observes. More local sources also undoubtedly inform Meitner's knowledge about the Holocaust which Baer painstakingly traces. These include an article penned by the chief rabbi responsible for the area where Miner's synagogue was based, or a 1942 article in the Sunday Express about the mass murder of Jews through gassing. Taken together, all of these data points reveal that Miner derived a knowledge of the Holocaust from numerous accounts of the National Socialist mass extermination of Jews in Poland, knowledge that however incomplete, led him to use his art to bear witness to these words. In my view, his decision to do so cuts to the very fraught nature of the Holocaust's ostensibly, ostensible unrepre unrepresentability. In a nutshell, if Theodore Adorno spoke of the barbarity of writing poetry after Auschwitz, what were the stakes of doing so during, or more precisely, of creating art that responded to the Holocaust atro atrocities while they were occurring. As for Meitner's art that he made in response to the Holocaust, he certainly felt a direct kinship with those who were perishing. This is suggested not only by the fact that Meitner, a Jew, fled Germany to escape persecution, but also um, by the way that in 1943, he described the cycle suffering of the Jews in Poland as forcing himself to, quote, think constantly, constantly of the fate of my brothers, end quote. Yet beyond such a perceived connection with fellow Jews being persecuted and murdered in Poland, Meitner almost certainly understood the works as a platform for heightening awareness about the Holocaust, somewhat in the spirit of his 1914 series of graphic artworks titled War, which sought to direct attention to the atrocities of World War I. As Baer rightly notes, this motivation suggests that minor, minor cycle suffering of the Jews in Poland may be situated within a wider interest among artists in making serial artworks to cast a spotlight on the horrors of war, with Francisco Goya's The Disaster of War, The Disasters of War from 1810-1820, and Otto Dix's 1924 cycle War, um, serving as important precedents. However, whereas Goya and Dix made such works in proximity to wartime uh, atrocities, be it by residing in the same country, as Bear remarks uh, was the case with Goya, or by serving in the army on the battlefields, as with Dix, Meitner created these works in an ambivalent position of exile. On the one hand, he occupied a position of relative safety. On the other hand, he remained estranged from his country as an exiled artist and, for a time, from those in his immediate proximity in Britain, as occurred when living in an internment camp. Seen from this vantage point, even if Miner's position as an artist in exile did not encompass the same kind of trauma associated with the horrors of mass extermination, it nevertheless constituted one facet of trauma inhabited and experienced by the artist thereby adding texture to the form of traumatic realism captured by his work. In short, however incomplete information about the Holocaust may have been in late 1942 and 43 among um, those living in Great Britain and other allied countries, Baer's analysis draws attention to the basic but crucial fact that much did remain known about Holocaust-related atrocities at the time. Just as crucially, Miner's response to these atrocities through his works casts attention to how he, as an artist in exile, sought to make sense of such information and the occasional gaps in such information. Indeed, what seems significant here is not simply that Miner himself responded to such information, with his art becoming a visual record of his own awareness of the Holocaust. More specifically, Baer's careful analysis reveals that many of the formal choices he made were almost certainly meant to spur critical thought and reflection among audiences 
about the Holocaust. As a case in point, consider Baer's incisive comments about Leiner's steel chambers with burning corpses. Um, and I'll quote her comments here at length to clarify just how she considered the work's formal vocabulary a means to heighten a spectator's own Holocaust knowledge. In her words, the iteration of the rectangular ovens, directional flames, and smoke do not prevent the spectator from attempting to reconfigure the bodies amid the conflagration, as foreshortened body parts and feet protrude into our space. There is no safe psychological um, distance between the viewer and the two-dimensional representation, as Minor takes advantage of the kinetic implications of extending action and motion comparable to the reading of cartoons or filmic vision. Indeed, even when focusing on the repetition of hieroglyphic and dynamic figural movement, as in his other work, Recoiling People from Around the Time, Minor prompts the viewer into anticipating an unseen perpetrator beyond the frame of reference, the before and after of the bodily and mental anguish of the Jewish people of Poland. To my mind, one key reason for this passage's significance is that Baer demonstrates how Minor uses formal devices such as serial, movement, and framing to make facets of the Holocaust more visceral to spectators, despite the incomplete nature of publicly accept, um, accessible information. This was ex um, evident, for example, in what Paul, uh, Baer calls the, quote, iteration of rectangular ovens, end quote, to collapse a spectator's psychological distance from the image and, by extension, from the, quote, body parts and feet, end quote, within these ovens. This was further evident in what she deems the implicit temporality of this work's framing devices, which, in her reading, anticipate the temporality of Jewish suffering and the looming presence of a spectator just beyond the image's borders. Through such observation, uh, Bear persuasively positions the work shown here as one that draws on certain ideas and features of filmic and protofilmic imagery. And in so doing, she expands our understanding of how certain aspects of modern visual culture became deployed to heighten awareness of Nazi aggression. Among other implications, this encourages us to consider the overlaps and disconnects between Meitner's Holocaust-related work and the imagery of other modernist artists in exile who sought to depict aspects of Nazi aggression, such as John Hartfield. If Bear's comments exemplify her interest in issues of spectatorial address, and by extension, in the ways that Minor used formal devices to heighten Holocaust knowledge among those viewing his works, these remarks also point to how she nuanced wider discussions of traumatic realism among scholars of visual art. To this end, briefly consider the 2002 monograph, um, Memory Effects, The Holocaust and the Art of Secondary Witnessing, by art historian and cultural critic Dora Apple, who used Robert, uh, Rothbard's notion of um, uh, traumatic realism to examine art created from the 1990s onward by artists born after the Holocaust. In this important study, Apple followed the rather familiar rhetorical move of using the concept of traumatic realism to analyze how artists represented the Holocaust as a form of self-expression. And she does so by specifically considering how such artists served as, quote, secondary witnesses, end quote, who did not experience the Holocaust firsthand. Um, Apple's uh, engagement with the concept certainly has parallels with the way that Baer draws on the notion to consider how Meidner responded to the events of the Holocaust while in exile. <coughs> that said, Baer shifts at least part of the emphasis away from <coughs> issues of self-expression toward issues of spectatorial address. In so doing, she presaged a move that Rothbard himself would make much later through his concept of implicated subjects. The title of the book he authored roughly 20 years later following his influential account of traumatic realism. <laughs> After all, although Baer does not probe the fraught territory uh, occupied by subjects who are neither purely victim nor perpetrator, as Rothbard um, did 
uh, in his words, in his exploration of implicated subjects. She does pay considerable attention to the formal strategies used by an artist to make spectators reflect on their own relationship to an artwork and, by extension, to their own implication within the forms of violence and injustice represented, a significant but largely overlooked aspect of Rothberg's recent work. In this respect, um, there is, instantiates a larger ongoing attempt among historians of art and visual culture to develop new methodologies for making sense of how artists have represented, responded to, and attempted to deepen an audience's knowledge of the trauma associated with the Holocaust. With Griselda Pollock's 2018 book, Charlemagne Solomon and the Theater of Memory being but one notable recent example. In closing, it is worth noting that after the war, Leiner did not consider the suffering of the Jews in Poland uh, an effective artistic response to the Holocaust. As Bear points out, in a 1945 letter to a former, former student, Leiner wrote that the works, quote, looked like a complete reduction to absurdity, completely harmless and cozy next to the photographic documentation of the gruesome reality, end quote. For Bear, this response points to a possible, quote, the grudging envy of photography as a medium necessary and perhaps better suited to bearing witness, end quote. Yet what Bear's work opened my own eyes to is both the necessity of accounting for how artists sought to bear witness to the Holocaust in the face of in, uh, incomplete information and how they did so by developing formal vocabularies that would speak to audiences in different ways than photographs and other forms of evidence that may broadly be considered documentary. Indeed, if we learn anything from applying art historical methods to studying the Holocaust, it is that a rigorous contextual, formal, and conceptual interrogation of imagery matters deeply. For it is only that's through such an interrogation that we may uh, deepen our own knowledge of the Holocaust of an image's connection to these events, and more fundamentally, a visual culture's connections to forms of authoritarianism and genocide across the long variety. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, couldn't stay the, um, the, the afternoon session, um, but I think we've got a lot to talk about um, amongst um, ourselves, so thank you for these three really remarkable papers. And I see lots of points of, of course, distinction and differentiation. Um, and I'm especially appreciative of um, the reflection on Shunanit's work um, in the final paper, but all through the papers, the threads of that. Um, what I'm interested in asking you about is this um, tension between um, the kind of medium as subject, medium as bodily um, um, representation, the physicality of making these objects, and then the remove, the unrepresentability of it um, as a point of overlap and contrast and also connectivity. And so I was wondering if I could ask each of you to sort of reflect upon how some of these works, in fact, um, material-wise and method-wise and the kind of the artist's own experience figure, figure in, um, if, if, if that seems clear as a sort of process. Because I actually do see, even though there's some obvious overlaps with trees and wood and paper, um, I see some very complicated entanglements um, with, with the way in which these papers um, work together. And I think also with, with Dot's paper to start with. Um, would you jump in? <laughs> um, and because we're recording, we are going to be a bit pedantic with our microphones. OK. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> to watch. Good, thank you. Um, yes, indeed, um, um, representability was um, the preoccupation of Kate Colbert's for uh, nearly 10 years until she produced her woodcut series, in which it was evident from letters and diaries that she had really uh, finally got something off her chest, I mean, and this has been written about in psychoanalytic terms, in terms of mourning. Shulamit also refers to this, and in particular to 
If you um, witness the series of drawings and attempts at a sculpture, at a memorial sculpture that she went through, you see with reason why she became frustrated and abandoned um, one medium after another until, in fact, she came across woodcut. And it is as if some spark uh, triggered something in her. There was an emotional connection. And she recognized that this was a medium in which uh, I think the physical and the mental effort together and the concentration that is required well, it evidently had a cathartic effect, and um, that, that's how she writes about it. And in, in fact, um, you can see in some of her drawings, and, and Shulamit points this out in her, in her um, chapter on Colbert, the way she would work and overwork and work at a charcoal drawing um, in order to really seal something in. And she was writing at the time in her diaries, Colbert, that when she did manage to draw, which depended on her mood, uh, she did feel that she was becoming closer to her lost son in the work. So that's how I think you can see that there's something invested there that brings results. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just to pick up on uh, Nicola was saying there, uh, it strikes me, uh, also during your paper when you mentioned uh, Barlock saying that, he turned to the woodcut so as not to fall apart. Mm -hmm. There's something uh, interesting about uh, the, the act of woodcut making during that First World War period. Of course, wood is a readily available material. Mm -hmm. In wartime, you can still access wood if you can't access canvas. Um, it becomes a form of art therapy for all of these artists, isn't it? Um, which Schmidt Rodloff makes similar statements yeah. about, uh, and so does Edsler Vickirka. That it's the only medium for me now. That's right. Yeah. And uh, that came through in your paper. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ludwig Meiden also makes extraordinary woodcuts. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the woodcut medium and also the phenomenon of messianic expressionism, which connects Barlach, maybe Meidner, and Schmidt Rodloff as well yeah. during that First World War period. Yeah, that cut into inner self, like literally, that was a beautiful quote, and just sort of the figure out of the material. You could look at trees and see what's emerging, but I think for these artists, it was really, really profound and deep in there. For Minder, I think it was a bit, well, one of the things that struck me about Minder's work on the Holocaust was how he used materials so differently than his earlier expressionist works with which we're perhaps most familiar. I remember vividly looking at those with a thick impasto, and it just has such a incredible materiality. With the watercolors and drawings that form this, this cycle that I was referring to, I haven't seen them in person, so I can't state for certainty, but one of the things that strikes me in looking at the um, uh, reproductions is this blurring. Uh, it's not complete, but it's you see it around the edges, and it's certainly present in the charcoal drawings, but also in the watercolors, by definition, with that medium, it bleeds to water. Um, and one of the questions I wrestled with was, to what end? Uh, and it seemed to me that he may have been doing two things, and I'm throwing a hypothesis out here rather than a firm uh, statement, but one is that there is that conflation of and there, I, I think specifically of this um, image of bodies kind of um, um, kind of going like a, a flood into out of um, out of um, train wagons, and I feel like that was this this like a, a visualization of blurring that for him was kind of um, on representing the dehumanization of bodies, how bodies become <coughs> subject becomes object. So I felt like that might be at play there. I also thought that there was something uh, with that blurring uh, between um, ultimately life and death. Um, and I think here of images, I don't know if I showed them, but they were um, uh, corpses suspended from, from trees. And uh, for that, it, it pointed to an ambivalence. Yeah, I'd like to open up um, questions, comments, observations um, from the audience. Yes, sir. Are you going to? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you all very much indeed, of course. But, um, uh, Michael, I'd like to ask you to say whether the works were exhibited or published in an album 
or what? And, and were they made? Where where did you say they were made? In London. They were made. Well, yeah, he was in exile in Britain, and after um, the camp, pardon. After he was came down from the Isle of Man. Yes, exactly. Yes. So um, we don't know, and this is, I mean, Bear has, we don't know exactly, to my knowledge, whether these were exhibited during the um, the um, World War II. Uh, and so if, uh, if anybody can clarify that point, I'd be grateful. But, um, uh, and so there is, if we think about questions of audience, then one of the natural things where it's not so much for the audiences of that moment, although he may have intention, he may have envisioned them as such, but he's speaking to audiences more broadly about audiences then and now, or then or, or at different moments of time, about the, it's at once a response to the Holocaust and an attempt to um, make sense through these visual features of of that um, of that. Of those events, um, so and then afterwards, they definitely were um, exhibited. I don't know the exhibition history, but I um, there was uh, a German exhibition that was um, that that showed them at least in the 1980s, and then uh, they very well uh, um, probably were um, exhibited beforehand. But, but that obviously would be useful to know about these questions of. of Sarah's, um, hi, I'm Rachel from Benary, mm -hmm. you may choose the same when you can. <laughs> um, just a point, uh, Schoenbeck wrote uh, an essay about an exhibition that was held at Benary in 1946 47 mm -hmm. on subjects of Jewish interest and the number of his Holocaust related images were included then. I don't know off the top of my head without checking the catalogue which images were included, but there's obviously strong relationship. Thank you. So definitely worth checking with the um, Benary archives. Um, yes, I don't mind, but it's a way there are interesting overlaps in, in our work. Um, just considering some of the overlaps, I um, much enjoyed your discussion about Michael Rothman's uh, text. Uh, yes, Rachel, I think, is on to something there. And that, that, that exhibition was followed in 1947, I believe, by a two-person show of, of Meidner and Elsa Meidner. Uh, 49. 49, in which perhaps some of those drawings were seen again. Is that right? Um, and I wonder that you meant to suggest that Meidner continues to work on the, on the cycle when he returns to, to Germany. He... So that was in 1953. He returns to. Yeah, does he return to the cycle at that point? No, not to my knowledge. Uh, no. Um, I mean, in part because he struggled so much with the how to rework those those pieces um, in light of all that evidence that was coming to. You know, and on the question of the glorious, uh, it is the case that he had information obviously he'd seen photographs. But he was still working from a historical precedent and from his own imagination too. Yeah, it's, it's, so there is one of the account for some of the blur. Yeah, um, but potentially, I, I mean, I think that he, he was working from well over a hundred photographs. I mean, if if we look at that one book alone that Bear uh, points out as a very likely source, so he did have some photographic evidence. <clears throat> but I mean, I think he's he's choosing. I, I, this is perhaps to uh, strengthen what you're saying. It's if he's trying to differentiate it from photography, perhaps that's uh, one uh, further reason for that, that blurring. I propose that we um, keep to our schedule. Um, and um, first of all, um, I would um, like to thank all um, four speakers um, in our first panel. Um, it's the days off to a roaring start, I would say. Um, and I would like to just make a few announcements. So we'll reconvene. Um, and start at 4.30 on the dot. Um, we're doing this in the spirit of German modernism, and so we will carry on in that manner. Um, so let us um, recommence, um, because we have...
three um, additional wonderful talks out in the lineup this afternoon. Um, Dr. Lucy Grossensteiner is director of the Lieberman Villa in Berlin. She studied law at Bristol and Oxford universities and completed her MA and PhD in art history when we won her over in those other fields um, at the Cornwall Institute under the supervision of Julie Lieberman. Her research explores the art of German speaking Europe from 1871 national socialist cultural policy and its international implications, UK German um, cultural relations, and provenance research. Her recent books include 20th Century German Art, Answering Degenerate Art from 1930s London from 2019, and her edited volume, Sites of Interchange, Modernism, Politics, and Culture Between Britain and Germany, 1919 to 1935, which came out, out in 2021, and includes an essay by Shulian. Her paper today is Greta Ring, Dealing in Modernism from Berlin to British Exile. Welcome to the scene. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming today. And uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Robin. And um, thank you, Robin and Glenn, for the invitation to give this presentation today. Um, Again, I'd like to start with a, a couple of brief words um, about Shula Mid. We met when I came for my interview for the MA programme uh, back in 2009, also rather clueless, coming from a different field. And from the moment we met, I, I felt this, this amazing knowledge, but also this guidance, this kind of desire to, to guide and to bring people together. And that's really something that... Um, that I, that I experienced throughout the time of knowing her. She guided me through my PhD. Uh, she was a constant source of advice after its conclusion and an important contributor to many of my later projects, as we've just heard. I owe Chulamit so much, and so it really is a real privilege to be able to speak here today. So as many of you will know, and as we've heard already today, much of Shulamit's research into German modernism was concerned with both the specific role and experience of women within it and on the impact of exile after 1933. So when the Liebermann Villa was approached with an idea for a research and exhibition project concerning a little known female dealer of modernism in Weimar era Berlin who then fled to Britain in exile in 1938, I was perhaps preconditioned to jump at the idea. Our museum, on the outskirts of Berlin, is dedicated to the painter Max Liebermann, leading German Impressionist, founder of the Berlin Secession, and later president of the Berlin Academy of Arts. And the museum is located in his former summer home on the banks of Lake Wannsee, as we can see here. At the Liebermann Villa, we already knew of the name Greta Ring. We knew she was born in Berlin in 1887, and indeed she was a, a niece of Max and Martha Liebermann. Her mother was a sister of Martha Liebermann. We knew she had completed a PhD in art history in 1912 under, under Heinrich Wolfling uh, concerning a, a Dutch portrait painting in the 15th and 16th century. We knew that from around 1919 she'd worked for Liebermann's most important dealer, Paul Kassila, in his firm, the Kunstsalon Kassina. And here we see the opening wall from our exhibition in Berlin where um, the main protagonists <coughs> were, were displayed. So in the center we have the between bottom left, Paul Kassina. We knew that at the Kassina firm, Greater Ring had worked alongside Walter Feichenfeld, who we see here at the bottom sitting in his car. And that following Paul Kassina's suicide in 1926, Greta Ring and Walter Feichenfeld had taken over the Kunstsalon Kassina together. Beyond this, however, Greta Ring was something of an unknown. Many of the papers from the Kunstsalon Kassina before 1933 didn't survive the war, and as far as we could see, there was no archive or library holding the Greta Ring papers. As it turned out, after Ring's death in 1952, leaving no spouse or children, a portion of her papers had been inherited by her business partner, Walter Feichenfeld, and his wife, the photographer Mariana Breslauer, who is the fourth face we see here on the wall. And these papers were now in the possession of their two sons. 
The family approached us offering access to these materials and then we were awarded a grant from the Berlin Senate which crucially allowed us to expand the research into other sources between Britain and Germany. And the results of this research were presented in an exhibition at the Liebermann Villa last autumn, which was also accompanied by a catalogue. It was really remarkable what we were able to uncover about Greta Ring in such a short period of time. For those of you experienced with exhibitions, it's always an extremely uh, condensed process, working to the catalogue deadline. But what we were able to discover about her, her achievements, her network, the reputation she enjoyed, both as a dealer and as an art historian, in Germany and internationally, from the 1920s right through to the early 1950s, we really had the feeling we had only scratched the surface. And what I would like to try and do today is give a sense of this remarkable career and how we conducted the research, what sources we were able to find, and to ask the question then, why has she and her impact been so overlooked in the years since her death? in 1952. Is it really as simple as because she was a woman in a man's world or were other factors at work? This is of course a complex question and I only have 20 minutes <laughs> and so I would like to approach the presentation through Ring's work for and with one particular German modernist artist with whom she connect, uh, remained connected throughout her career and who is also in many ways connected to the Courtauld, uh, Oskar Kokoschka. What do her interactions with Kokoschka and the evidence left of them today reveal about Greta Ring's career and how we remember it. So we'll start in the 1920s, already before, actually starting a little early, even before Greta Ring had joined the Casera firm, Kokoschka one of, was one of the key artists promoted by them. Kokoschka's first Berlin exhibition took place at the Kunstsalon Casera in 1910. Casera published Kokoschka's four dramas in 1919, and once Greta Ring had joined the company, around 1919-1920, these Kokoschka projects continued. An exhibition of Kokoschka landscapes in 1925, for example, or an exhibition and auction of drawings in 1926, together with the firm of Hugo Helbing in Munich, as we see here. In the materials from these projects in the 1920s, Greta Ring isn't named. This was typical but many of the catalogues and brochures produced by the Consalon Casera at this time. And indeed, her colleague, Walter Feichenfeld, wasn't named either. Indeed, looking at this catalogue, one would think that Paul Casera himself had held the auction, although by October 1926, he'd been dead for 10 months. <laughs> but Kokoschka and Ring certainly knew each other. And they were close enough for Kokoschka to paint Greta Ring's portrait sometime around 1923. This fantastic watercolour was almost certainly a gift from Kokoschka to Ring, but we don't know anything about its provenance. It didn't form part of the greater Ring materials held by the Feichenfeld family after Ring's death. Rather, it was found by chance by us during our exhibition preparations by searching online auction result uh, databases. And luckily, we managed to contact the lender and, agree, and he agreed to lend it to the show. When one researches around the activities of the Casera firm at this time, and indeed the art market in Berlin more generally, it's clear that both Greta Ring and Walter Feichenfeld were well known as the faces of the Kunstsalon Casera, in particular after Casera's death in January 1926. Indeed, they were so well known that they could be caricatured in the art press without being named. This is a drawing published in the journal Kunst und Kunstler in 1928, covering another major auction staged by, jointly by the firm Kassira and Hugo Helbig. And here we see all the main protagonists, clearly recognisable, from the bespectacled Helbing standing in the middle, to the somewhat dashing Feichenfeld seated almost in the background, and in the foreground, the rather sceptical looking Greta Ring. The way Ring is depicted here gives us a lot of clues about how her personality was perceived. She was clearly known for her directness and that she didn't suffer fools gladly. Hearing the words of her friend Mariana Breslauer writing in her memoirs in the 1980s, I quote, Greater Ring was an absolutely unusual woman, irresistible, admired by everyone, and indeed a little feared, indeed a little feared, because she was afraid of nothing and no one. And further, she was feared by many for her disarming directness. It seems that this impression of Ring was shared by a number of others. 
Indeed, she was known already in the Berlin of the 1920s by the nickname The Witch, even by her own friends, <laughs> and by the mid-1920s, Ring is indeed calling herself this. And there's a series of letters about the house she built in Sacro near Berlin in the 1920s that she refers to throughout the correspondence as The Witch's House. Breslauer later wrote that this name came from Ring's habit of regularly flying with aeroplanes, rather unusual at the time, and these were then referred to as her witch's broom. But this name appears with such regularity, and also after her death, one wonders if it arose as a way to deal with a perhaps unusually difficult woman, and in turn, if it came to have an impact on how she was remembered by her contemporaries. By the late 1920s, Greater Ring's success and her personality were also being recognised abroad. In 1928, she was involved with another high-profile Kokoschka project, namely a solo exhibition of his paintings at London's Leicester Galleries. This was a significant early showcase for Kokoschka in London, with 34 oil paintings on show. And uh, what's great is the example of this catalogue in the Berlin Art Library is annotated, uh, work sold, and you can see that a good portion of them were sold, according to these annotations. Um, and it was also recognised as, as a success in the German press. As one newspaper in Cologne described it, for the first time, London has had the chance to see an expressionist artist. One can say that no private exhibition of the last few years has enjoyed such crowds on its opening day as this one. And no exhibition of recent times has attracted so much general interest. Now again, looking at this catalogue, looking at the exhibition materials, you would have no idea that Greta Ring is involved. But luckily there exists an article from the Yorkshire Post published to coincide with the opening, which confirms Ring's central involvement. The article was written by the journalist Sybil Vincent and appeared in the Yorkshire Post's column for Women of Today. <laughs> Sybil Vincent was, um, I think it's relevant to mention, her uncle was Viscount Davenon, the British ambas ambassador to Germany between 1920 and 1926, and Vincent later went on to marry a uh, tape curator D.C. Finchon. So she knew the art world, she knew Germany. And Vincent describes Ring in the article as follows. I quote, the only, women art, the only woman art dealer in Europe of real importance, as far as I know, one of the foremost living experts on the Flemish school of painting, but Frau Ring does not concentrate entirely on old masters. Pictures by the most modern painters of every school are frequently shown at her gallery in Berlin. At the moment, she is in England for the exhibition, which she has arranged at the Leicester Galleries of the pictures of Oskar Kokoschka. Vincent was clearly enamoured with the then 41-year-old Ring, as she describes her further, a small, neat figure, always well-dressed, still young enough to enjoy her work and pleasure to the full, she begged to be taken to dinner. And once there, if I hadn't bothered her to talk about her career, she would have enjoyed herself like a child. And this is, by the way, Mariana Breslau's portrait of Greta Ring from around this time. The article then goes on to explore Ring's position as a woman dealer on the European art market, although only briefly. Ring is quoted, for example, as follows. No, I don't think there are any other established women art dealers, with the exception, perhaps, of your Miss Dorothy Warren. Women are involved in dealership businesses, she explains, but mainly as support for their husbands. She's also asked why she thinks this is, and Vincent quotes her as follows. <coughs> I suppose it's chiefly a matter of luck. Of course, being an art dealer is a hard life, and I'm constantly travelling from one country to the other. It's difficult to enter the big firms, and few women possess sufficient capital to start on their own. Anyhow, to start a new venture of this kind nowadays requires an almost superhuman ability and knowledge. Clearly, Ring was not too comfortable ruminating on the particular difficulties faced by women on the art market. Vincent's article concludes as follows. At this point, Frau Ring declined to say anything more about herself or discuss the possibilities of the art expert's career for women. She returned to the Austrian painter, whose pictures she is delighted to have helped assemble in London. This is the only evidence we found of Ring speaking about the specific challenges facing women on the art market. Clearly, it was unusual for a woman to have such a career as Greta Ring at this time. But there's no evidence that Ring actively advocated for women to be more present on the market, and even in Vincent's article, we sense her reluctance to speak in detail on the topic. Greta Ring was, however, prepared to stand up against the developing cultural politics of the National Socialists. 
Skipping forward four years, I would like to briefly mention a series of commercial exhibitions organised by Ring back in Berlin, together with the Dusseldorf art dealer Alfred Flechtheim from 1932. These shows, under the title Lebendige Deutsche Kunst, Living German Art, were staged between autumn 32 and spring 1933 in the rooms of the Kunstsalon Kassira in Berlin, and they showed a selection of the artists later divided as degenerate in Germany, including Oskar Kokoschka. For this show, Ring was sure to appear as author of the catalogue forward, in which she advocated explicitly for modern art and openly criticised cultural conservatism. To hear briefly, quote, any dividing line between old and new art is random and unjustified, serving only to restrict and confuse those interested in art. Both Greta Ring and Walter Feichenfeld, and indeed his partner Marianne Breslauer, were of Jewish heritage, and all three of them were ultimately forced to leave Germany. Feichenfeld and Breslauer to Holland and then on to Switzerland, and Greta Ring to Britain, where she arrived in 1938. Aged 51, she started a new life in London. And in 1939, she was able to establish a London branch of the Casera Company, the Paul Casera Limited, in premises at 11 Cleveland Row, close to Green Park. And it's actually fantastic that we have this drawing because we went to Cleveland Row to try and get a photograph of this building, and it is such a narrow street, you basically can't, you can't take this photograph of this building, so it's nice to have one. Ring was able to bring a selection of materials with her from Berlin to London. Her most important letters, documents, photographs, and a private collection of around 100 French and German drawings. But of course, exile was a significant disruption, not only to her life and her career, but also to her personal archive. Yes, the materials today with the Feichenfeld family are highly valuable, but important, important pieces of the story are missing. And following Greater Ring's network, in Berlin and in exile was particularly valuable for us during the research. <laughs> One example here is her friendship with the artist and illustrator Katerina Wolczynski. Wolczynski and Ring knew each other already in Berlin. Both then came to Britain as emigres after 1933. There's some evidence that they lived together for a while in London, but certainly they remained close friends. Wolczynski repeatedly produced such greetings cards for the Kassira business in London and for Ring personally, <laughs> And in Wilczynski's estate at the Berlin Art Library, we found this fantastic drawing of Greta Ring from 1949. Here is another example of the scattered Greta Ring archive, bringing us back to Ring's connection with Kokoschka. This drawing was made by Kokoschka for Ring in December 1951. By this time, Ring was already ill with cancer. She would die the following year, in 1952, at the age of 65. Kukushka writes on the drawing in a fantastic combination of German and English, um, for mein Gretchen zum Nikolo, so for my little Greta for Christmas, and then in English, be good and cheer up, in order that we have a nice party soonest in London, in your house, love yours, OK, 51. We know from the Kokoschka literature that Greta Ring was actively <coughs> selling for the artist after 1945, and the, extent, the exact extent of this business relationship remains to be researched. This drawing evidently researched, uh, reached Greta Ring in the hospital, but again, its provenance after her death is not known. Like the portrait of Ring, it was first discovered on the art market decades later. As my last point today, I would like to refer briefly to what are arguably the two most significant moments for Greta Ring's legacy after her exile to Britain. On the one hand, her monograph, her only monograph, A Century of French Painting, 1400 to 1500, published by Fyodon in 1949, notably in English and in a French edition, and the gift made of her collection of drawings to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford in accordance with her will in 1954. Um, as I mentioned, this was a collection of around 100 French and German 19th century drawings. It became clear to us during the research that Ring's book remained for decades a standard text for those working in the field. And the gift of the Ashmolean was also recognised, and how it is recognised until today as the core of their collection. Uh, and we can see here on the slide how in the catalogue of the Ashmolean's drawing collection, Mariana Breslau's photographic portrait of Greater Ring is published in the opening pages of the volume. So important is Greater Ring's gift. But neither of these outputs really serve to put Greater Ring on the map. Why? Again, 
There's probably a number of answers to that question, but I would like to draw attention to one. Both the monograph and the donation were not concerned with the newest modernist developments. Would she have found greater renown in post-war Britain if she'd been more clearly seen as having brought artistic modernism to Britain, as so many of her <laughs> contemporaries have since been portrayed? <clears throat> Greta Ring was clearly a remarkable figure. A trailblazing woman dealer who managed to build a career in Weimar era Berlin and continue it in British exile. But researching her life, we also quickly recognise a number of factors which have obscured her work in the years since. <laughs> The fact she was a dealer. She was, even in Berlin, often working behind the scenes as an intermediary, producing, for example, sales catalogues, which were later, particularly in the years before digitization, quickly forgotten. Added to this, her career was interrupted by exile, perhaps for this reason, she produced only one monograph during her lifetime. As a successful woman art dealer, she was also clearly something of an outlier, an unusual figure with a direct personality, <coughs> resulting, for example, in nicknames which undermined her significance. And in British exile, she was not so clearly associated with the newest developments of modern, at that, uh, modernism at that time being forced out of Nazi Germany, despite her ongoing work for such artists, and thus perhaps falling out of narratives exploring the modernist influence of such emigres on the British scene. Without a family, her death, after her death, her archive was scattered. Yes, a large portion was left to the Feigenfeld family, but significant gaps remained to be researched. Luckily for us, Greater Ring was clearly very popular, highly respected among those who knew her. And it's this network which has already helped us fill in the gaps and which promises potential for the next steps. I'd like to close today uh, and cite a letter from Oskar Kokoschka written to Walter Feigenfeld in August 1952, shortly after, he did, uh, after Greta Ring's death, as he wrote, Dearest Feigen, today is the darkest day it's been all week. Clouds, rain, cold, and I'm also sad, as is older, because the poor, good old Greta is no longer riding around on her broomstick. I can't stand the thought that it has to be this way, that she's now lying on the earth, under the earth and not rattling around in her house in London and offering me a whiskey. I'd rather it was me and that she was still alive. Many thanks. <laughs>
Elsa Meitner was born into the family of a wealthy, liberal Jewish doctor in Berlin in 1901. Determined to become an artist against her parents' wishes, she found encouragement from Katie Kolbitz and Max Lefort. In 1925, she attended Ludwig Meitner's drawing class at the Studienatelier for Malerei und Plastik. They were married two years later. Elsa struggled to assert her own artistic identity alongside her more reclusive, deeply rich, religious husband, 16 years her senior and already a celebrated painter. Intent on discovering her own subject matter and style, she declined his offer to work jointly on paintings. <coughs> Soon, she started to be noticed, and in 1928, her etching portraying the writer Alfred Döblin was awarded a prize by the artist's group Die Schaffenden. Her first solo exhibition at the Jury Freie in Berlin in 1932 was well received by the critics, one critic seeing a promising future for her. With the National Socialists' rise to power, this future was dramatically altered. Despite the inclusion of Ludwig's work in the infamous Munich exhibition of degenerate art in 1937, the Meitners were reluctant to leave Germany and only decided to emigrate to England in August 1939. Abject poverty characterized their existence. At first, Elsa accepted a position as a servant in Sydenham, while Ludwig found a dwelling in Camden Town. Upon his release from internment in 1941, the couple moved in together in Golders Green, yet they would increasingly grow apart and develop their own artistic visions. The claustrophobic living conditions are captured in this drawing from 1944. It shows father and son working at opposite ends of the table in a dark, sparsely furnished room where a small stove provides scant comfort. With great effort, Ludwig managed to earn a meager living for the family with occasional portrait commissions and drawing lessons. <coughs> Elsie was forced back for clothes and food. In a letter to friends in 1942, Ludwig described Elsa's situation. My wife is very downcast because the struggle for existence leaves her no time for her art. She has had little luck in the meantime. Her great power as an artist <clears throat> has not been recognized by anyone here. She has been lonelier than ever before. Ludwig identified three of the main issues Elsa struggled with both personally and artistically. As a woman, she was responsible for raising their son, David, and running a household, thus unable to focus her energy on creating art. In 1968, she summed up this common dilemma, quote, when a man becomes a painter, he does nothing but paint. But women are expected to do all the mundane things too, and that's what ruined me." End quote. A lack of artistic recognition, which Ludwig mentions next, overshadowed Elsa's entire life in exile, where her continental roots and training, which shaped her art in both style and subject matter, marked her out as different. In 1938, Herbert Reed summed up the prevailing attitude towards contemporary German art. It would not be untrue to say that the general public in Great Britain, modern art is totally unknown. Modern German art is totally unknown. Even among those who are particularly concerned with modern art, art critics, collectors, and dealers, it is almost entirely neglected. After the war, her adherence to figurative art, in obvious contrast to the dominating contemporary abstract trends which she abhorred, further marked her out as unfashionable. Her works were shown in a few exhibitions in London, Frankfurt, and Darmstadt during her lifetime, yet sustained critical recognition and commercial success failed to appear. Besides an indifferent public, Elsa was faced with a husband who, although generally supportive, could be confrontational and severely critical at times. By 1948, the Meitner's economic circumstances had worsened, and they had to limit themselves to one room. Elsa, responding perhaps in protest to that desperate situation, 
began employing vivid, often shocking coloration in her pictures. Self-portrait and nude are two examples of her new style. Ludwig did not hide his dislike of what he disparagingly called the new look in her work, which to him resembled, quote, a kind of peasant art, primitivism a la West End art salon, end quote, that he found deplorable. Despite such condemnation, Elsie carried on creating art, perhaps because she possessed an inner need to tell a human story by way of painting, engraving, and drawing, as the emigre art historian Josef Tarwodi noted. Her large oeuvre would eventually comprise 2,200 works, many portraits, self-portraits, landscapes, and still lives. There was no shortage of inspiration for her, since, as she conceded in old age, she drew it from the pain she experienced, for life has afforded me little joy. The third issue Ludwig mentions, Elsa's loneliness, would only become worse over time. In 1951, David emigrated to Israel, and two years later, Ludwig returned to Germany. Elsa felt that, quote, the Germans have destroyed my love for Germany, root and branch, burning it with a glowing iron for my heart, unquote. She refused to go back and stay on in London on her own. And yet, although she received British citizenship in 1954, she could not suppress a feeling of alienation. Quote, here in London, I walk around as in a dream and wonder why I am here. There are plants that thrive everywhere when you transplant them, but I could never grow new roots. My roots have stayed in Berlin. Unquote. In 1959, she noted resignedly, I have no friends at all. In this drawing, part of a series from the early 1950s, Elsa depicts an area of her garden. A fence and a massive tree give the impression of enclosure and confinement. The painting interior from the late 1950s amplifies this sense of isolation. It shows a corner of her crowded studio in which a radio and the phone provide her only link to the outside world. In the 1961 drawing, Seated Woman, perhaps a self-portrait, Elsa presents the sitter with her back to the viewer. Her total refusal of engagement is the ultimate expression of withdrawal. And yet, Elsa was not without friends in England, mainly drawn from the circle of fellow emigres. They supported her financially and artistically. Among them were the art dealer Siegfried Oppenheimer and the above mentioned Joseph Paul Rodin, a staunch promoter of emigre artists in post-war London. Upon meeting the Midas in 1953, he publicized Elsa's, Elsa's art in numerous articles, and in 1979 edited Aus den Erinnerungen von Elsa Meidner, from the memories of Elsa Meidner, which combined a review of her life with an appreciation of her work. The Benuri Art Gallery was also a loyal supporter in 1949, it put on a joint exhibition of Elsa and Ludwig. The show attracted several positive reviews, yet, according to Hodin, went basically unnoticed, and Ludwig later likened it to a second-class funeral. <laughs> Benuri had a retrospective exhibition of Elsa's work in 1964, soon after her return from Germany, where she had spent a few months with her husband, who had become increasingly ill. Yet the couple had not got on, and Elsie had been unable to find much support for her art there. The exhibition received little attention, and the press response was either reserved or negative. Elsie, having sold only one drawing, especially lamented the apathy of her fellow Jews. Quote, Our people do not buy pictures. You can't eat them. You can't wear them, and you don't need them. <laughs> I just recovered my expenses." End quote. The lack of response only reinforced Elsa's long-held view of rejection. Quote, I am a Jew, and nothing else. I wish I could collaborate on a Jewish culture, but I am not allowed to do that here. No one knows about me. End quote. 
now in her mid-60s, an arthritic condition made work increasingly difficult for Elsa. Shortly after Ludwig's death in 1966, she gave up painting altogether, both for health reasons as well as resignation. Her last pictures reflect the mounting seclusion, depression and bitterness that she felt. The circle of people portrayed grew ever smaller until almost all that remained were self-portraits and depictions of her sister Hildegard. Her last dated work is from 1967. The following year, she confided in Hodin, now I am broken. In 1969, she stated, I've lost life's battle. Elsa died in 1987 and was buried in Bushy Jewish Cemetery in Hertfordshire. Hodin served as executor of her estate. His sizable collection of her work became the basis for her inclusion in an exhibition of emigre artists that John Denham put on at his gallery in West Hampstead in 1990. Elsa, who had once resignedly called herself the greatest collector, collector of Elsa Meitner's works, <laughs> is now represented in just a few public collections in the UK. Two portraits, acquired in the late 1980s, belong to the Benuri. The other two works, found respectively at the Tate and the British Museum, are dedicated to the allegorical motif of death and the maiden. Popular with German artists since the Middle Ages, and also with Kletkowitz, Elsa was preoccupied with it all her life. In 1983, Odin had presented two of her works to the Tate. The trustees, although interested in the artist and her history, did not feel that they should do more than accept one work for the collection. This haunting image was the reaction of the teenage Elsa to the serious illnesses and multiple deaths she witnessed through her father's medical practice. The British Museum's version of Death and the Maiden was created some 30 years later. In this striking large rendering, a kneeling nude holds a skeletal winged death who comforts her tenderly. She seems to welcome death as a gentle friend, the only companion left to turn to in her loneliness and desperation. Elsa's estate was first kept at Kibbutz Kluchot, where David had lived. In 2001, it found a permanent home in the Ludwig Meidner archive at the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt. Later this year, a series of small displays of Elsa's portrait drawings will be shown there, and around 70 works will be published in the museum's online collection. Elsa Meidner had the misfortune of being left out of the canon twice. Rejected by the National Socialists, she was re removed from public consciousness in Germany for decades. Her foreign style and subject matter made no impact on a largely indifferent conservative British audience who proceeded to ignore her. And even the Jewish community paid no attention to her and her art. Exile defined and limited her art. She is still waiting to be discovered. Thank you. The final speaker is Dr. Glenn Zujo, artist, writer, educator. He focuses his attention on the recovery of drawing language in art education and the discourses of visual culture after the Holocaust, underpinned by his vibrant studio practice. These activities inform discussion <coughs> of art of the Holocaust, perplexity and meaning in the Cambridge history of the Holocaust. Uh, forthcoming from Cambridge University Press. Also, Yehuda Bacon, The Curse of Hand, in The Cold Shower of a New Life, The Post-War Diaries of a Child Survivor in 2019, and Musulman, A Distilled Image of the Lager, in concentrationary, uh, concentrationary Memories from 2014. Earlier curatorial projects include Legacies of Silence, The Visual Arts and Holocaust Memory, Imperial War Museum in London 2001, Artists witnessed the Shoah, Graves Art Gallery, Sheffield, 1950.
1995, and drawing on these shores a view of British drawing and its affinities, which toured nationally through 1993-94. His paper today is The Review and the part of Marx as evolutionary witness. Welcome back. <laughs> What an extraordinary, moving occasion this is. And I feel very privileged to be part of this panel of uh, one of our speakers. It's become a kind of, it feels like an intimate conversation we're having. Uh, many overlaps, many interesting and shared, shared um, concerns. This really is my tribute to a dear friend, Shalini Pair. The revealed hand, cathartic marks as evidentiary witness. Crawling through Bear's catalog essays, books, articles, lectures, in preparation for this day. I'm reminded of that two way dialogue of entwined voices sparked by our meetings in the altruistic space of learning. A dialogue this essay and the wider context of the collection seeks to revive. At the root of it is the realization that artworks are always more than mere passive repositories of aestheticizing caves, but exercise a profound influence over the spectator. In a review of Horst Redekamp's Image Acts, a systematic approach to visual agency, art historian Matthew Brantley noted that works of art exercise a, quote, Medusa-like power over the spectator, <coughs> They do so through an array of visual devices, inscriptions that speak in the first person or gaze back at the beholder. Living images understood not merely as representations, but as a, quote, substitution for the real thing, unquote. self referential and seemingly self-aware. In the cross-weave of image and text found in Bear's authoritative Women Artists and Expressionists from Empower to Emancipation, Princeton, 2022. Readers encounter an array of learned literary, philosophical, and art historical illusion. Footnotes offer tantalizing avenues of research, such that in her chapter, Katy Corbett's The Expressions of New York and the Making of Her Career, we encounter the concept of the Augenblick, the decisive moment, figuratively speaking in the blink of an eye, that instant of time that in philosopher Coral Ward's phrase inscribes the human inexorably in the temporal world. In this twinned study of the artist's called its left hand clenched and spy, we recognize one such moment, the liminal passage from single into married life, inscribed in the ringed finger of the hand, this two-part iteration and reworking produces a flashpoint of great emotive force, where the interaction of body, the visually centered eye, the sensory haptic condition of touch, conjure what Horst Bredekamp described as preconditions for the capacity to think, and perhaps also to feel. <coughs> the drawing strikes us with its curious reflexivity, the hand drawing the hand. It's assured, steely sharpness brought into relief by the deft movements, practiced inflections of muscle, tendon, ligament, the balls of the fingers, effortly transposed into hieroglyph marks of an unfeigned truthfulness and directness. Hand and wrist advance in a diagonal pathway as purveyors of truth, witness to an urgent exchange. The term Handzeichnung, loosely translated as the hand-drawn sketch, linguistically allies the thinking hand and the hieroglyph mark as partners in a single pictorial, scriptorial act. In an essay aptly titled In Praise of Hands, Paris 1938, art historian Henri Fossignon observed, I quote, the hand means action, 
it grasps, it creates, at times it would even seem to think, <coughs> I could, referring to Hans as this other intelligence. Describing the moment when the learned physician in Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulip, 1632, reaches for the cadaver's left arm, prizing it to demonstrate the hand's nervous reflexes. His lithe, articulate hands placed conspicuously alongside the dead man's limp arm ushers the following remark from Posillon. Hands are the instruments of creation. But even before that, they are an organ of knowledge. His words echo the eminent 19th century physician Claude Bernal's remark that, quote, a skillful hand without the head that directs it is a blind instrument. The head without the fulfilling hand remains powerless. A fully developed study of Corbett's left hand preceding a betrothal to Karl Corbett on June 13, 1891, unleashes tempestuous brushstrokes on steely lines attesting to what the artist and critic Diana Pathenbridge referred to as, quote, the mystic marriage of line and wash. Here, fingers clutch at folds of grapes that, illumined from a source beyond the drawing's edge, gleam whiter than the page, in a scintillating display of light from fine tints to intense shades of black. Where hands and faces are laid bare, Exposed to scrutiny, Golden scholar Francis Perry observes, quote, hands were, after all, a kind of portrait, unquote. a point that would not have escaped the German filmmaker Hans Kuhlis, whose later cinematic portraits of artists that were collectively titled <coughs> Schaffen der Hande, Great of Hands, claim futurity for Captain Golden's drawings, drawing hand through the medium of film. The relationship of hand and head in Colbert's early self-portrait studies is always present with me. There writes, quote, it signifies a status and sphere of activity previously regarded as manual, which was to become invested with indexical markers of genius. <coughs> Colbert's emergence as the leading graphic artist of a generation transformed a practice that, as Bell has shown, remained until then the preserve of male artists. <laughs> there, Carey, and Elizabeth Brenninger all agree on the timely nature of the encounter of young Kathy Schmidt, she was then, and her instructor, the Swiss born portraitist Carl Stauffer Bergen, who, recognizing her extraordinary gifts, gently steered her away from painting towards drawing introducing her to the work of his fellow draftsman, printmaker, and theorist, Max Klinger. In the drawing, we're privy to a conversation between the two friends. The study and formality of the drawing, its apparent state of unfinish, was doubtless calculated to impress connoisseurs and collectors of Stafford Byrne's work. In turn, Klinger's cycle of actions, I'm living, <coughs> a life, 1884, and more importantly, his theoretical writings in defense of drawing, Malabé and Zeichner, proved decisive for the direction of Colbert's work. Klinger coined the term Griffelkunst in that essay from the German for stylus, the griffel, a pointed drawing tool, pencil, quill, or metal point, to distinguish drawing from other art forms. Arriving at a thoroughly modern formulation, I quote, a work of art can be perfect only if it's created with materials that give the fullest expression to its underlying premise. Unquote. Expression, then, is contingent on the materials used, and, quote, every material has its own spirit and its own poetry, unquote. It's clear. Called itself personally addressed by Klinger's remark that, quote, the terrible contrast between the beauty they, the artists, seek and the awfulness of existence, which comes screaming towards them, must not be silenced. 
he expands this idea in a later reference to what he calls the abhorrent subject, all things ugly, gruesome, or repulsive. When broached with extreme emotion, adding, quote, if these contrasts are not to be lost, there must be another art beyond painting and sculpture. That art is the drawing. The tumultuousness <coughs> of his visions, contained in the sweet Iron Hanshu, Love, 1881, the strange parable of a young man's hopeless infatuation with an elusive, fetishized love, prefigures the obsessive imagery of surrealism. The oddities of scale and irrational juxtapositions preclude an anchoring in reality and, emotionally charged, betray a disturbed subject of the two. In Corbett's Auschwitz farewell, the figure's translucent or liquid appearance produces an hypnotic effect. Her hourglass contours, almost extinguished by multiple erasures with the ulnar surface of the hand, retain some semblance of the living, breathing figure. These observations bring to mind Klinger's insistence that drawing was complete only on the viewer's imagination. Bodies are portrayed not as things, but as phenomena. It's instructive to compare this study. With other related studies, Michael Ovitz for Abschied. Here on the right, the suggestion of the skeletal armature, skull-like heads, linked arms, provide an anatomical underpinning, never detracting from the indissoluble bond and upward spiral that allows the figures in Baer's words to, quote, forego gravity, unquote. Highly attuned to the early and current gestative states of Kovitz's drawing manner, and to the kinetic challenges that human figures in motion pose for the artist, Abschied offers a point of departure for Baer's reflections on the nature of artistic agency of graphic impulse. <laughs> in this sense, Bear and I share a fascination for the arching, rhythmic, improvisatory sequences of the figure in motion that became the centerpiece of my pedagogy at the Royal Drawing School in London and the National Society of the in Jerusalem for 20 years. I move on to part two of my presentation, some distance from Colbert's world. And maybe not. You'll see. Human creations are easily destroyed, and science and technology, which have built them up, can also be used for their annihilation. Freud's essay, The Future of an Illusion, 1927, criticized religion and religiosity in general as a delusion, a compensatory escape from the harsh reality of existence. The response to Roman Roland's notion of the oceanic feeling as a sensation of eternity, the source of limitless creativity, openness to speculation, and the stepping out of rigid, rationalist frameworks. <clears throat> Forty years later, Theodore Adorno and Marx Horkheimer warned of the alarming conjunction of instrumentally rational means and irrational ends that they saw as Nazism le Nazism's legacy. It was this virtually unlimited technological potential to realize limitless ambitions that, in Michael Rothberg's view, quote, gave human cruelty its distinctly modern touch and made the Gulag, Auschwitz, and Hiroshima possible, perhaps even unavoidable, unquote. Lea Grundig's Blasphema in the Valley of Death, from a cycle of 17 drawings first published in Dresden in 1943, and then again in Dresden in 1947, locates the expression of impulse in disturbing reflections on the fictive Jewish communities in occupied Europe. Exiled to Palestine in spring 1943, 
following and her incarceration in a Gestapo prison. The Dresden-born artist and activist drew on early reports of atrocities in Poland to bring us face to face with the victims of Nazi terror. Her blasphemer in the Valley of Death, with terrifying gaze, flailing arms and ensnaring hands, is a wretched prophet of doom amid a sea of fallen victims. If clothed, then the ghetto, dystopian antechamber to the death camps, a containing barbed wire fence already visible in the middle distance. Celebrated as a painter of expressionist apocalyptic landscapes, described by there as, quote, a subterranean experience of cosmic eruptive forces, unquote. Ludwig Meidner is known also as a prolific graphic artist, draftsman, poet, and a contributor to specialist journals in the rapidly expanding German print culture of the early 20th century. We've already heard a great deal about Meidner in Michael's wonderful talk earlier. In this self-portrait study with the textual accompaniment, I, battered lump of clay, ostracized, apocalyptic, my skull swept by the wind. Meidner negotiates, I quote, the complex dynamic between German and Jewish identities in the early decades of the 20th century, I quote, assuming the guise of a visionary or prophet that in Bear's words testifies to the construction of his artistic identity. The sketchbooks, 51 of them now collected in Catalogue on edited by Eric Riedel and Georg Pressler, record the techniques of drawing there again as, I quote, performative, both the subjective agency and outsider status, the emboldened gestural line, like the calligraphy, forging his mark and name simultaneously. Alluding to an earlier self-portrait we reduced on the cover of the May 1913 copy of Das Neue Partos, a journal Meidner helped co-edit, there observes the futurist, the futurist dynam dynamism of the city is allowed to infiltrate the transparent features of the face, the one embodying the other and vice versa. Primacy being given to the creative energy or spark of the artist's hand. Those qualities inform the manipulations of line in a brilliant likeness self-portrait with Bjorn, executed in Berlin in 1920, that self-consciously invokes Klinger's notion of the Gilf of Kunst artist. Meitner's experience of the brutality of armed conflict in two world wars found an outlet in a regained spiritual pacifism in the ritual practices of Orthodox Judaism and in the portrayal of Old Testament prophets that reveal in Bear's phrase, quote, Meidner's frequent negotiation of his self-image, When in 1933, Jakob Steinhardt, the Berlin educated artist and co-founder with Meidner and Richard Young Tour of the short-lived Atetika group, was briefly detained and forced to flee Germany for Eretz Israel, mandatory Palestine. The affinities that had once informed their work appear to wane for a time. Remarkably, within a year of the end of World War II, those shared bonds resurface in a group of heads of prophets and praying Jews that begin to configure a Jewish response to the unprecedented losses in the Shoah. Philosopher Rosalind de Rose, whose views on ethics, embodiment, generosity, and difference lie within the habit of Bear's reading of Nietzsche's work, notes that the relationship of self and other is governed by, I quote, the will to power, not a being, not a becoming, but a pathos, Nietzsche's phrase, pathos in turn described by Deep Rose as the condition of transient affectivity. Several events in Meidner's life, as we heard, the rising wave of anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany, and with it the curtailment of his teaching and exhibiting outlets, the confiscation of his paintings from the collections, the Kristallnacht pogroms of 9th and 10th November 1938, and the burning of the historic Romstrasse synagogue in Cologne 
where Meidner and his wife Elsa had established a home the preceding year, compelled the couple to flee Germany and travel to England, arriving on the 2nd of August 1939, within weeks of the start of the war. In a letter to his friend in exile, Hilda Rosenbaum, Meidner and the affair is existential suffering. Quote, this disdainful fatherland is for us a treacherous step fatherland to which I never want to return. Unquote. When, against the theater of war, the British Home Office stepped up its internment of German and Austrian citizens under the provisions of the Young Aliens Act, Meidner was detained at Morach camp on the Isle of Man. There explains that for Meidner, internment offered security from a blitzstorm London an instant community of German-speaking intellectuals, models to draw from, and a strongly observant Jewish, Jewish circles to interact with. When, within a year of internment, Meidner was offered a discharge, he chose instead to remain in confinement for a further nine months, spending the last six weeks on the island in Hutchinson Camp in Douglas, where other notable artists, among them Kurt Schlitters, Fred Ullmann, and the art historian Klaus Hinrichsen, were also interned. As Bella acknowledges in her notes for memorial lecture delivered in Leicester in May 2014, with I was present at, I knew Margaret von Duschen, as you know, was there too, and of course her very de devoted family. Lecture called The Expressionist Ludwig Meidner, Exile, Creativity, and Holocaust Awareness. <coughs> the group of 17 sketchbooks produced by Meidner under these conditions attest to a, quote, re-engagement with the public sphere beyond the barbed wire, unquote. Nothing quite prepares us, she writes, for the visceral contouring of atrocities within a concentration in the universe. The viewer encounters in my first cycle, Lady, Der Juden in Poland, suffering of the Jews in Poland, that followed a year or so after his release. Cycle does not constitute a homogenous, unified structure. Rather, it's composed of perhaps some 40 works in a range of techniques that together address the theme of genocide. It suggests a complex interplay of allegory and a response to history. Meidner found a role model in the English visionary William Blake, whose works he recalled seeing both during and soon after the war in the artist's retrospective at Tate Gallery in 1947. Writing to his friend and fellow exile, Hinder Rosenbaum, he remarked, for the last few weeks, I've been working on a new cycle of watercolor drawings. By such means, I am compelled ever more perpetually to think about the destiny of my brothers. These sheets will be vivid, clear, without glossing over, neither sensational nor excessively crass. They capture the tragedy realistically. Mysticism is far from these works. And yet, elsewhere, he appears to contradict himself, writing, I quote, Imagination and divination are gaining power over me, similar to that of the great William Blake, that mystical painter poet from London. In the second of Blake's continental prophecies, Europe, composed in 1794, they presents in mythopoeic form glimpses of the opposing forces that dominated the revolutionary era he, era he lived through, the American and French revolutions, configured in apocalyptic and biblical terms, foreshadowing events in Meidner's own lifetime. I quote from Blake from that sheet which you see in front of you from, from Europe, the prophecy. Sitting in fathomless abyss of my immortal shrine, I seize their burning power and bring forth howling terrors, all devouring fiery kings, devouring and devoured, roaming on dark and desolate mountains, in forests of eternal death, shrieking in hollow trees. The prophetic voice, as much as the sheer painterliness of the individual and colored plates, <coughs> appealed to Meidner, then at work on the cycle, suffering of the Jews of Poland. Having earlier addressed our celebrated, if absent colleague, formerly as Bear, 
Here I will transition to the more familiar Shulamit, as many of us knew and remember her. What we didn't learn then, we make up for later. In recalling our work together, and when scouring the libraries for her published works in past weeks, a wide field of learning opened before me. Together with fellow speakers, we have accounted for only a small part of that learning. Impossible to resume in a two to three thousand word essay. A longer appraisal awaits. But here I wanted to record a rare WhatsApp message that arrived on the 25th of December 2020. We were all, I recall, in lockdown. Just days earlier, Shulamit and I had exchanged seasonal Hanukkah greetings. But on this occasion, the piercing image of Kolwitz's hand studie arrived without excursus or accompanying message. The full graphic and emotive force of the image, Kolwitz's hand reaching forward, drawing implement in hand, an image so redolent of the moment, an epistolary exchange now, con now conducted in the ether, reminds me today how inexorably our lives are inscribed in the present moment, a mere wink of an eye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we invite the three speakers up? Wonderful. Thank you to all three of you for really beautifully researched um, and really deeply moving um, papers um, and, um, and thinking about how these elements go together. Look, I've lost my own sheet as well. <laughs> um, how, how I might start off by putting them together in some way in, in some sort of dialogue. And it seems to me um, that, in fact, gaps of is the actually connected um, sinew between these things. What is present? What is no longer present? What was once present and is no longer with us? Um, the role of theory and um, and I really appreciate the different formulations that we um, saw Freud and um, Nietzsche and um, others. Um, really, I thought, um, brought them together in, in that way. And so um, yeah, and so I wanted to sort of address these kind of gaps and how we as researchers contend with them because that's actually, we're looking in the archive, we're looking for things always, we're looking for the answers and the connectivity, right? <clears throat> and so we have to sit with the gaps, what we don't know, and I like how each of you elucidated what we don't know and, and how we don't know it, and, and it's not that it's necessarily unknowable, right? These archives have been destroyed. History has destroyed them, exile has destroyed them, the 20th century and its um, effects into the 21st century um, has destroyed them. And so what I found um, really moving about all of your works um, and the relationships also, that relationships you've all vividly with Shulamit, with um, husband and wife, right? Complicated relationships there. Um, also, husband and wife and other people involved, possibly, who knows? Um, so I also found that interesting. What is the gaps between human relationships and how, how we strive to connect in many ways? Um, and so I wanted to just sort of throw that back. Um, in some ways, we can start with Lucy because she has made a career of putting, filling gaps that seem unfillable, right? Um, she just keeps digging. <laughs> um, and she ha probably has some sparkly powder that she's not going to explain about how some, of she, some of the things that she finds. So I just want to uh, allow you each to sort of ruminate for a moment on, on the importance of gaps, on the unknowable, um, and how that is actually enriching for the PhD students who are in the audience, and those of us just searching for answers in our own work and our own lives. Yeah, well, I, I can, I'm very happy to start on that topic because it was one of the things that I really took from Shulamit very early on, was this idea of uh, where are the archives? What are the archives? And I think, again, when you come from bachelor to master's, you're kind of thinking, <laughs> okay, what can, what can I write about? Oh, here there's lots of books. That's great. I'll start with that. And, and I remember one of the first essays I wrote for Shulamit was about Herbert Reed, and I found all the literature about Herbert Reed, and I very faithfully reproduced everything, and, and she was kind of like, hmm, yes, okay, 
but where's the archives? Where, you know, what's new here? What have you found? And being able to be having to say, ah, oh, yeah. And that is something that I then have told my own uh, students that I supervise and any, anyone will care to listen, this kind of drive to find some the traces that people leave behind. And I think that's what then brought me to provenance research as a way of highlighting, in the case of my PhD, a, a, a historical exhibition as a new way. You know, this exhibition that I researched, there was no archives in the institution, there was no archives with any of the people who had organised it, but we more or less knew what had been shown. And so provenance research allowed us to put together the story of the exhibition from these traces. So something that's been very influential, I think, uh, for, for, my, for my career, for my research. And uh, I think it's a very nice, simple driving idea for anybody studying art history to think, yeah, what, what, am, what am I dealing with? Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. For me, the, mm. one of the greatest joys of being art historian is making new discoveries. So it doesn't have to be the Rembrandt in the attic, but just an archive, unexpected, find, a, found in, a find in the archive, just completely unexpected, um, not necessarily under the name Elsa Might, whoever it might be, you might be researching, but completely unconnected, and you find something which you go, aha, that's exactly the piece I need. Mm. And while I was writing on my piece on Elsa Might, I, I was thinking, I still haven't managed to go to Frankfurt and see the 1,300 works they have there. And they're not online yet. Mm. Um, only a small selection will be available soon. But I haven't seen the bulk of, of the works. So I had to rely on, on the published works in catalogs. They just happen to be published. So uh, probably a slightly, if not ho hopefully not too different, picture of Elsa Meitner will appear once all the works can be actually seen traveling to Frankfurt. So. But we don't know what, what there is still. Mm -hmm. So much is still well, not published or easily accessible. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember Shalamid always say, with slightly her exasperation in her voice, that Glenn, where is the methodology? <laughs> That's the other one. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I didn't have an answer. Uh, I don't think I have an answer. But this was really a, a, way, a chance to delve back into the bare literature and really to think about the nature of the dialogue we had. So much in the learning, teaching, learning relationship is, un, is not verbal. It's something about the example of presence of the person, the silences, the listening, so much, so important. And it's sort of trying to, to recover that, to get back into that rather privileged space that the court uh, uh, provided to be over decades of my life, but um, focus now on the figure of Shulamit. And one question that, yeah, you know, I think the really, I think about what, what Shulamit left uh, in me, it was a kind of a, I had to do a volte face. I had to go back to look at the culture that my father and his family had fled from in 1934. Berlin was their home. Yes, they had also had homes in Latin America before that that they could return to. But nonetheless, it meant an interruption to a rich life. Um, and, and, and the question that has grown in me, and I know that there are people in this room who have answers to this question, is how did Shulamit do it? With her, you know, Lithuanian background, with a household where her parents spoke Yiddish to another. other. And I saw in the 20 years that I knew Shulamit, an increasing uh, approchement to the uh, traditional, to the ritual observances. Uh, she made close friends uh, with her synagogue, uh, with her rabbi uh, in uh, her local synagogue community. Um, and, and so the question for me was, how did, how did, did she let me hold these two worlds together? And what drew her to the German language, above all, and then to ger German culture, not in the sort of dystopic, through the kind of dystopic lens that I was looking at it through my, with my Holocaust studies hat on, but in a, in a sort of positive, a positive agency, really. And that has, in a sense, changed my life, because it's, it's opened up again a, culture, language, people, experience, history, that I really avoided by all, at all costs for long periods of my life. I, just, I think, you know, understandably. Um, yes. 
I think that that answers yeah, your question. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to um, open up to the audience um, thoughts and also um, over the course of the day, um, hopefully all of you, I've learned a huge amount and this is already something I you know, feel that I'm familiar with. Um, but yeah, questions um, for the panel or um, I guess. Thanks, thanks very much. Yeah. And all of you address certain issues. We're sitting in a country that certainly in the 20th century has um, elected to either forget or neglect mm -hmm. this like quite a lot of art that we can talk about. <coughs> and thinking of Bristol being um, a lack of success, one might say, in one sense. But there wasn't a very fertile ground. I think the manual that you showed of that. Esther Gallery's caution catalog was off to Tate, now sits off down the Boyne Street. Um, and it's a history that repeated itself many times. Most of the works by German or Austrian artists were um, given, very few were bought. And Fever Mum's last self portrait was in the Tate collection, and probably shown last 30 years ago. It's a great painting, actually, in the National Gallery, which also pre-1900 bit doesn't show the, the death of Sire Curzon um, by the end. And I think, so there's a, there's kind of Reed was unfortunately not wealthy enough to have gone for all the works he could have gone for the uh, German art exhibition, 20th century and much of the ADRA, all kinds of paper exhibitions that, where um, German artists' works were very expensive, they were just they would have sold. And all of those opportunities but they literally made certain progress in certain areas. The most collections here had the last two being the collection under the Barbie Institute in London and the National Gallery in London. And then before that, 20 years ago, um, the beautiful uh, Gavin Linton up in the um, City Art Gallery. So I think you have to change the atmosphere in this country to allow things to happen. And it slowly has been happening. In the opening up of the archives, you all talked about so eloquently, not least that 30 years ago the idea of an emigre archive being accessible for art historians, art historians based here, was almost an unheard of thing, and now quite a lot of them the data archive and being digitized. So it's in a sense trying, from my perspective, to draw together certain evolutions between an art of the Second World War. And that neglect that sort of actually most should be a car in the bus or the room takeout visiting Ron Lally, who was a very um, generous and <coughs> who recognized those achievements right up to now, where there are opportunities, and in fact, the forms of both men, you all made about going to the archives, finding out what's in the archives, because there are countless treasures and they are beginning to be catalogued, they're beginning to be ordered, they're beginning to be partially digitized. And they're not in Frankfurt, they're in London. So I think that Schumann's legacy can actually take us from this rather dire position which has worked so diligently on for so many years to possibly a better, more understanding place. One of his other Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, I think everybody in the group, you know, honestly, rich and indeed frequently very moving. Afternoon, so it's many, many thanks. But I remain slightly perturbed by the fact that the one, in terms of those, going back to Sean's comments, those who came to the safety of England, the term that has been used again and again by nearly everybody is exile. Now, I'm not the first or the last one to bring up this, obviously, but the notion of exile suggests a yearning for a homeland. And I think the two, there are several quotations from both miners, which made it very clear, even though Ludwig actually made the decision, which seemed quite a difficult one, to actually go back in the 1950s. <clears throat> this, you know, they, it was an exile. In fact, it was forced displacement. And on the back of that, I'd just like to suggest again, going back to Sean's comments about the wealth of archives that still remain to be explored in this country, that actually what we need to think about is, and this is going on from, you know, the emphasis on German art in Germany, but we, heard about the space that we've heard about the Holocaust many times over the course of this afternoon, but to actually look at the richness of the cultural interactions, the influences that they bring with them, yes? So the sense of a kind of cultural symbiosis is perhaps
somebody who's been slightly neglected today. And just going back again to the, the neglect, I mean, I was very intrigued, and I don't think I knew this when I give talks about Kokoschka's research in this country. You know, I always say he was the great grand old man of the Austrian and German expressions and barely know or certainly not admired in this country. But one of you mentioned the 1928 Leicester Galleries show, mm. a sellout. I mean, not maybe not a sellout, but it yeah. sold well. It's a reminder that it's not quite that simple. It's very easy to say you know, it was it just about got to terms with French Impressionism, but you know, German art will thank you for all sorts of complicated reasons. But you know, you mentioned Herbert Reed. There were Roland Penrose, and there, you know, there are key figures who were really important in mediating between that Germanic and rather alien culture, as it's seen in this country, and, and the reception of those who came here. Absolutely, and, and I, I can definitely confirm that from my own research looking at the 1938 German, Express uh, German Modernism show, is that I wanted to research this idea, you know, this idea that oh, it was all unknown and the British didn't like it and everybody was disappointed, wasn't the case. And yeah, of course, then there was the war and that had its own impact. But I kind of make the argument in, in my book that if it hadn't been for the war, that was actually quite a growing interest in German Modernism in London. And, and to, you know, a lot of the, you know, like I say, this, this annotated uh, catalogue we found seems to suggest around half were sold. That's a pretty good result, 1928, for any artist, I would have imagined, you know? So, uh, yeah, and just to, just to clarify as well, uh, Greta Ring was successful in exile. Uh, and I think it also then ties to your point as well, Monica, mm -hmm. of different experiences of coming to Britain, different, very, very different. You know, you have someone like the Meigners, essentially penniless, struggling. Greta Ring clearly came with with property still and assets and was able to set herself up and she was very well connected and she'd been very wealthy in Berlin and, and she, I think the impression we've got this post-war career we could only kind of sketch over but she was working a lot in, 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 in the direction of America, um, Switzerland and that, that was a successful career although only then seven years after the war because of, because of her illness. Too bad. I just want to thank you for a really terrific uh, panel of discussion. Um, I'm from New York, I'm a Shlamis, I'm from the Lamy, one of the nephews, and I really have the most incredibly fortunate to be here today to have uh, heard uh, beautiful thoughts. But, um, one of the things about uh, Shlamis is that we really need to know. Uh, what incredible work she's doing over all these years because she was so modest and um, so quiet in her ways. And um, one of the things that I learned, that, well, I learned a lot about Shumi, so I'm deeply appreciative. Uh, but one of the things that, um, that I learned about her is, is how, uh, from today's talk, but also that I've been able to. Um, discover uh, um, over the years. Um, I'm uh, a psychoanalyst in practice, and um, I should admit we always pay tremendous attention to very close detail of what people would say and what, how they would be, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's the quality that I think uh, she brought to this. Uh, Work, this archival uh, discovery work that she that, that she would do, and uh, it's so uh, wonderful for me to know that uh, there's uh, this woman in uh, my past and uh, in the present uh, when, I, when I didn't know her that that was capable of paying such close attention to really um, beautiful things that people were doing. Uh, and she brought to life um, uh, so many things. I just have one question. Uh, do you think that uh, there was a, an identification with Greta uh, uh, Ring? Um, just a question on my mind that your last uh, quote uh, was profoundly with it. Yeah, it's really funny that I, when I was I, actually this morning reading through the talk again, and this idea of of a fantastic woman being recreated through her network. I, just, I didn't even <laughs> put those two things together, but obviously that's what we're doing today. I, I'm, my research into Greta Ring started in 
uh, started a year ago, so Tulamit didn't know anything about it. Um, but of, of course, it just you know it makes you think this idea of the traces someone leaves behind and how a person is spoken about, and that being part, obviously, of their legacy is exactly what we're doing today. And I think uh, just to, again to say thank you for organising it because it's just such a wonderful thing. And as, as you know, there are people here who knew Shulamit a lot better than I did, but I think she would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Um, yeah. Of course. Oh, when, when, uh, okay. Um, I think you just kind of brought it up about the difference between Ed's experiences in London and Ed's employment. Is there any question regarding any of the affiliation with Albert Brechtman or Albert Brechtman's report he died here? Now, he died in 37? Yeah. 38? Yeah. It's a good question, and I would have to go and look for those letters because there's nothing in in the things that she left to the Feigenfeld, nothing but the Feigenfelds that I found about that relationship. But that does not mean that doesn't exist. And we found so much amazing stuff just by chance that, you know, like I say, we really have only scratched the surface. I would have to have a look. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, he was. I, I know he had a very hard time in the next Yeah. But, but um, I also want. To, I just want to say something about my my research with with Tuma, but, um, I found an exhibition catalog in the Crystal Library that was relevant to what I was working on, and I showed it for a while. I was, you know, working on the thesis, and she said, "Oh, it's great! Then you go to the Wiener Library and find a review of this exhibition. If you're a review of this exhibition, you know, what is your bail back So I did. I mean, you know, I knew it was going to be between these two months or something, and I did. And you know, and it was really useful. You know, and she just knew that it was there. It would be, it would be good. You know." Um, this is just a quick follow on to a previous question um, about Greta. I'm afraid to say again, but um, if she lived till 1950, what relationship 52. did she have? 52 yeah. or What relationship did she have or not have with a new generation of immigrants who ran the Moorba Gallery and the Hanover Gallery? Uh, and I mean, <coughs> Judah and so forth. I mean, yeah, it, I'm Rose afraid, and I don't know. I, it's something we really have to research. We found brief mentions of her doing deals, like I say, in the direction of America. She must have known these figures. She was, like I say, very successful after the war. We found her um, by chance when we went to the Ashmolean to look at the gift. We found that there was a, probably 500 letters between Greta Ring and Julius Held there. Um, going all the way through up to 1952, and she's talking about how much she's traveling after the war, doing, wow. working as a dealer. She's, she's in Venice, Paris, uh, Switzerland. Um, every two weeks, she's somewhere else. And so that whole aspect of her life is something that, I say, as I say, for time reasons, we had six months to put something together that we just had, had to just leave to one side. But um, it would be fascinating to find out what an impact she had in those seven years. Uh, Lucy, can I ask you something? Are you Lucy Watson? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to talk when I say something about your or maybe it was a PhD, but we'll talk about it. Okay. Yes, that's just me, yeah. When last... day. Um, thank you again um, to all of the speakers who have come, the family um, of shooting it, and um, of course the audience here. We are going to Antigone. Um, 
we are going to go next door um, to have um, a, so a festive and convivial um, um, event to which all of you are invited. Um, if you'd like to take a short break um, to any of the loos, um, please do. And then please grab a glass um, and a little snack, and we will recommence in about sort of 10 minutes. So um, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.